All right. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon if you're on the East Coast. Uh, this is Timehawk here from X Trades. Um, we're going to be beginning our auction seminar. This is our fourth seminar. Uh, I've been doing about what two two a month. Uh, so this is our fourth one, and the topic for today is on legging in. Uh, and that's mostly just for option spreads. So any of your more complex option strategies, um, you know, I get this question a lot, like, 
is it okay to leg into a spread? Well, what about legging out? Uh, is that something you do or don't do? So, you know, I figured I'd, I'd answer that question in this seminar and also talk a little bit about how you can use legging in uh, in order to avoid PDT. Because uh, I know I get a lot of questions about that too, and I often see people in our Discord chat room, and uh, that's X Trades, um, you know, asking about or talking about discussing like being stuck in trades or feeling like they have to swing something overnight, even though it's risky, or maybe they have a losing trade and they just hold it until expiration or uh, hold it for an additional day because they can't get out of a trade. Now, that often happens. I see that most often in, you know, our options chat room, right? Um, you know, with stocks and equities, usually not as big of an issue. I mean, sometimes if you're playing penny stocks, it might still matter a lot. But usually for stocks and equities, you can just kind of hold it out, right? Usually your stocks and equities aren't moving quite as fast as options, which can go to zero real quick. So with legging in, you can avoid PDT and get out of those situations when you need to. So that's kind of what uh, our main topic is for today. Um, and this is kind of a, a more simple or basic topic, in my opinion, right? So I will also be doing uh, some play highlights that I've done this month uh, and talk about, you know, those strategies that I use there uh, just briefly. But if you guys have any questions about other advanced strategies, I'd be happy to go over them. And then we'll have a Q&A session at the end, and you guys can ask me about other uh, advanced strategies. We can do some chart reviews uh, or even try to find some plays for next week. So that's uh, the general layout for today. And, um, you know, I probably should have asked this earlier, but can everybody hear me? Or am I just talking to myself here? All right, thank you. So I just wanted to make sure that uh, because uh, there's been a few times in the past where I forgot to change the settings or something and, uh, you know, the audio wasn't set up correctly and I was just talking to myself for 10 minutes and no one heard anything and I had to redo the whole thing. So um, I'm glad you guys can hear me. Uh, I do notice that there is definitely some lag time between me presenting and uh, probably what you guys are hearing. I am running this on a potato laptop. It's an Ultrabook, actually. And I have a lot of things open right now because of the streaming stuff. Um, and I've got some charting stuff going on in the background. So it's, it's a little bit slow. So hopefully that doesn't affect uh, your guys' um, enjoyment of this seminar or... How smooth this seminar is but okay let's get started so uh just quick introduction who am i if you're new to this channel welcome uh this is you know we're x trades we're a trading community um and you know we provide a lot of education around trading uh and we just provide a lot of good feedback on uh you know trades that you might take if you need some help with stuff come and check us out we also do provide uh, I guess what people commonly call signals or alerts. Uh, we do a lot of that as well. Um, but, you know, my main focus here today is on, on more of an educational side uh, to get you guys up to speed. So uh, I'm, again, Timehawk. I am a top analyst with Xtrades. That's our Discord link there. It's, um, I know the bot will probably also output that, and it's also in our description. Uh, I've been trading for about seven years, so... Uh, I mostly focus on swing trading. I do scalp and day trade as well, uh, but mostly I do focus on swing trading. And for me, that means overnight to a few weeks out. Uh, usually, if it's longer than that, then most of the time it's only just equity positions and not so much options. Um, and the purpose of this course, you know, we're we're going to cover everything, basics to advanced stuff. Uh, for this 
for Tech Clear One. I think this is a, a more basic seminar today. Uh, but as I mentioned, we're going to go over a few of the more advanced strategies as well that I utilized this month and just do a quick recap on those things. Uh, so, we, you know, we're trying to help you guys get more tools in your toolkit uh, and basically be able to adapt to any situation. Um, I'll also be going over uh, real life examples. I already mentioned that, like play highlights of this month. So let's see here. Uh, through this, uh, but this is what we're talking about today, right? Ligging in is and PDT is going to be our primary topics, and then some highlighted plays, Q and A on more advanced strategies. If you guys have any questions about uh, sp specific plays that you want to take a look at, oh uh, yeah, sorry, um, PDT is pattern day trading. So basically, if you're under twenty five k in uh, cash uh, in a margin account, and that's true for most users, uh, for example, on like Robinhood or something, and you're probably on a margin account, you can get a cash account. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, but, but basically, pattern day trading is where you can't make more than three day trades in any given five rolling trading days uh, if you are under 25K. And that's just a rule set up. Um, is really for safety purposes to prevent uh, newer traders from over trading, things like that. Uh, but we're going to talk about how we can navigate around PDT uh, today. So uh, in, in this seminar um, PowerPoint, I left a lot of definitions and stuff in here, but I'm just going to kind of breeze through them, not really talk about them. But I did leave these definitions in here in case you guys need to see them or you're not as familiar with the terms. Okay, um, but yeah, these are the definition slides. I do assume that, you know, you guys have some kind of basic understanding of options, and I'm going to do my typical full disclosure here. Probably should have done it earlier, but uh, all, everything I say is for educational purposes only. Nothing is, you know, a direct recommendation to buy or sell or to use a certain strategy, right? Um, it is for educational purposes, but I will show you my results using them, right? Some more definitions here. All right. Uh, advanced strategies, legs and spreads. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. I have another slide later on, so we're going to skip this data. Um, so for options, you guys all know data is really important. The closer you get to expiration, the faster the data value of your option decrease. That's why you often notice um, you know, if you're holding an options overnight, why, or, or even during a day, uh, and the price doesn't change, why is the value of the premium dropping? A couple of reasons possible, right? But data is one of them. Data actually works throughout a day. Uh, you, you will notice it more on weeklies, especially, right? Just some more charts here. All right. Going into our, one of the highlights from this, um, this month, since our last seminar, uh, earlier this month. So this was alerted earlier this week uh, on Thursday. So this was in our Discord chat. Um, but basically, this was a ER calendar spread play. So normally, and, and I know I did a seminar on this already, but you know I know I didn't upload it to YouTube yet or anything, and I know a lot of people have been asking about it, so I'm going to do a quick recap here. So normally, Calendar spreads, um, how you execute it, right, is you just have two options, one that you're buying and one that you're selling, right? And it's going to be the same strike. So in this example here, I traded Blink, uh, BLNK is the ticker, right? They had ERs on Thursday after hours. So here I have two options here one is march 26 which was the option expiring yesterday and then i took the one the following week which is next thursday uh, just friendly reminder next week is good friday so we have a short trading week uh but you know i took blnk april 1st and then you have the same strike 
So in this case, it was 34p. So uh, the strike was 34 and there were puts. So for a calendar spread, you pick the same strike, different day, you buy the further one out and you sell the one closer in, in terms of time. So a calendar spread is, is called a calendar spread exactly because it's, it's over time, right? That's why it's a calendar. Or you can also hear some people calling them horizontal spreads. So the advantage of a calendar spread uh, is that really we're just trying to take advantage of data. Because remember that um, data chart I showed you earlier? Uh, I know it was real quick, but basically as you get closer to expiration, your contract's premium is exponentially decreasing, right? Decaying. So the closer it is to expiration, the faster it loses the value. Um, and that's just because, you know, options represent essentially chances of something happening, right? As you get closer to expiration, there's less chance for a certain play to move big. So therefore the value decreases. So in this case, all we're trying to do here is in a calendar spread, you're normally looking for neutral strategies, right? You, you expect that there's not going to be much movement away from your strikes. So ideally, I want BLNK to expire on Friday uh, exactly at $34. And that's how I will make the most money on this plate because I'm getting a credit from selling the closer option. I'm letting that closer option get crushed in premium while my longer call option retains its value and that will be achieved the best at 34. Um, so anyways, uh, my specific version of the calendar spread is I play them over ERs. So we all know that when you have ERs, some tickers get a lot of hype, right? And then the ER happens and then, you know, sometimes they, they make amazing moves, but sometimes they don't move much at all. Uh, so with every single ER, usually there's an expected move related to that ER. So what I'm betting here is that the move is not as big as options are trying to price for, and that the front option will get IV crushed more after the earnings report, because now the uncertainty from the ER is gone. There's no longer that catalyst to make that front dated option move a lot. And of course, your back dated option will also be affected but the front option gets crushed more. And that's the idea behind these ER count spread plays. So uh, anyways, I took this play on Thursday uh, for 34p. And then I, I got in at 89 cents. I just took a few because it's over ER. You never know what's going to happen, right? And then the next morning, 6.36 a.m., I am on the, uh, I'm on the Pacific time. So... Basically, six minutes right after the opening bell, I closed this ER calendar spread by, by buying back the front dated option and selling my further dated option, right? And I sold it at $1.29. So that's uh, $0.40. Cents. So can't do the math right now, but four out of nine, I don't know what that is, but I'm guessing it's somewhere around 40, 40 to 50%. Okay. So that's a 40 to 50% win just from holding something overnight. You know, I literally bought this, open the spread, maybe 30 minutes or something before close. I, I don't really remember anymore. And then I closed it the next morning uh, with a limit. So I didn't even, you know, I just woke up and then I was like, I was filled. Uh, and then I alerted it. Um, but, you know, it, it was a simple play that because BLNK didn't move that much after the earnings reports and it got crushed. So, um, I do this pretty often. I find that this strategy is effective for me. I don't usually play that big on them. I usually go maybe up to like $2,000 at most for the play, usually somewhere between $1,000 and $2,000, depending on my confidence level, right? Um, but I have about an 80% success rate with these. You know, I always just set it at 30% limit sell. And then if it sells, I get, I take that profit. Um, and then if it if it's a loss, I usually just let it run until expiration. Uh, probably not the best strategy, honestly, but that's just how I like to play them because I treat them as lottos. Um, and then, you know, 
my success rate on, on these types of plays is high enough that overall my account for this strategy is pretty green for the year. Um, it's up about 25%, okay? So let's see. Let's talk about some guidelines for the ER calendar spreads. I'm gonna see if uh, there's any questions here in the chat. Sorry, I've been kind of neglecting the chat. Um, <laughs> how long is this seminar uh, by Just Trade? So I think the seminar, I'm planning on it to be about an hour, at, probably about an hour. Uh, today's a simpler topic, so it'll probably be pretty quick. And then, you know, I, I may go up to an hour and a half, uh, but basically whatever time we have left, and then if there are additional questions, I can go up to an hour and a half um, just to discuss any advanced strategies you guys might have in the chat or review charts, things like that. Uh, look for plays. Um, but the actual seminar itself, I, I'm expecting it to only be about 30, 40 minutes max, um, which is a lot shorter than previous seminars. <laughs> see here. Uh, so cash account, you only have 6K and it's a cash account. So, so there's no limitations on how much money you need to have a cash account. But if you're on a margin account, you need to have 25K a day trade. Um, peace music. Yes, so for a calendar spread, you do buy the further one out and you sell the closer one because you're trying to crush the front option while your further out option maintains its value or is not getting as crushed as the front option. And, you know, this applies to any kind of calendar spread. You're always trying to make the front option expire worthless and then the uh, further backdated option you want it to keep or maintain value, right? Uh, with ER, I like doing these for ER specifically because with ERs, usually there is greater option crush after an ER. So I'm trying to use a neutral strategy to take advantage of the fact that most options get crushed after ER. It's like even if a stock moves up after ER and you had calls on it, you would notice a lot of times you still end up losing on those calls because um, it just didn't move up enough because the premiums were too high relative to the actual move. So that's that's why I use that. Uh, ERs is earnings release. Yep. Okay. So uh, Raven, you asked, uh, can you just let the front date option you sold expire? Yes, you can let it expire, and you can just hold it. Um, but the reason why I limit sell it at thirty percent is because usually I, um, if the stock moves too far away from my strike price, then it's also possible to lose on my trade, right? So for example, in, in my previous example um, that I traded this week was, what was it, BLNK, 34P, right? So that's cut side. But what if, you know, the stock had went up to say $37? And in fact, that actually happened. Let me let me actually just pull it up on the chart so you guys can see. Uh, where's my mouse? Here it is. Snow. Let's pull up B L N K. So, did you know B L N K dropped up to over sixty percent from its all times highs? <laughs> from uh, February, like early February to March. <laughs> okay. Uh, anyways. Let's look at this ER play here. So I need to change my time frame so you can see what's going on. 15 minutes. Let's get the extended hours in so you can see that too. So uh, BLNK. So this is Friday and this is Thursday. The blue represents the pre-market hours and the yellow represents... Um, sorry, I, I got that backwards. Blue represents after hours and the yellow represents pre-market hours. Uh, but anyways, so I took the, this trade at the end of the day, last hour or so. The reason I do that is because I want to get a strike as close as possible to what BLNK was trading at, right? Because it's a calendar spread is a neutral strategy. I'm basing my percent change, the chance of change happening on BLNK from the closing price, right? Uh, so that's why I try to wait until the end. So I think it was trading around like $35 or so at the end of the day. 
I took 34p, and the reason why I did that was because uh, BLNK had been dropping, right? And then it rose into the end of the day, like throughout the whole day it was rising. So I figured, you know, I had a little bit bias, like, you know, maybe uh, BLNK is just running up because people are anticipating ER, then maybe it'll go back down. But I still got a strike that was close to it, so you should never go more than one strike away from it when doing DC, kind of the ER calendar plays. Um, that's how I play them anyways. So I took 34p, so it's a little bit slightly bear bias, but not too much, right? Then um, it dropped down to about 33.50 in after hours. So I was feeling really, really good about this play because uh, my calendar spread play, like I estimated that it could move two to three dollars away from 34, and I would still be at least break even. So this move, after right after hours, I was pretty confident that it would be. Now, I closed it at open. I had a limit sell for 30%. The reason is because 30% is good enough for me. And I don't want to stress about the trade. Now, I actually had somebody DM me who asked me if they should exit or not. A few people, actually. And I got some, you know, pings in the, in the main chat as well. But, uh, you know, I, I told people, you know, it's better to just take profits and not worry about the trade. So these people, some of them, uh, you know, we opened up at about 33, 35. We had a pretty wide range here, right? Let's go to a smaller time frame. But you can see that it, it just it opened at 33, pretty close to 34. Basically, I got filled around here, right? 30% profit. And then it just rose. 35, 36. And then it, an hour, two hours later after open, BLNK was at $37. Now, the people who are holding those 35 calendar spreads, their front day option is pretty much worthless. It's like, you know, probably worth like one cent or something or a dollar, right? But their back day option now is the only thing that has value to lose left. So now it is up $3 from that 34p. So, uh, you know, they told me I got some messages and they're like, oh, I'm down like, 20% or something, what should I do? And it's it's just like, this is why I just take it at the open, okay? And of course, BLNK did return back down to 34. And this is why I like to use ER calendar spreads because after ERs, usually a stock has a very wide range of moment of movement. And at some point in time, it will usually pass back that point. That's when you exit. Okay, sometimes it opens up here and then it dips really quickly and then it bounces back up. Maybe that time frame is only for five minutes. Maybe it's only one minute, right? But I notice a lot of times post ER, usually you have a very wide range of movement and, and at some point in time, usually you'll find that it, it will pass this point again, right? And so that's why I just set a limit sell and I don't worry about it and I just let it take profits. And if it doesn't hit, then I don't worry about it. And I found that this strategy is successful for me right? It's, it, there's no right or wrong way to, on how you want to play these. On the other hand, if you are bearish on BLNK, then sure, you can just let the front data option expire. And then maybe next week it goes down to, I don't know, $30 or something. And then you're, now your backdated option, you basically had a discounted put by selling the front data option, which expired worthless. And then you just hold your long leg and, and let it continue playing out, right? I, I don't really like to do that that often. Um, and if I do do that, I usually prefer to use calls instead because, uh, you know, markets tend to go up, right? So, and if I do do this, do that kind of a strategy, I also prefer to uh, use further date options. So I would say by like, you know, April 16th calls and I would sell um, March 26th calls or something instead. And then I could just hold it out and then let it rise. Basically, I you get a discounted um, back to the option. And that's how you would normally use calendar spreads. But anyways, uh, that's why I, I like to set limit sales, but just explain that because I don't like to deal with that kind of stress of seeing a trade go negative on me like that and then have to wait for the whole day on my edge of my seat, waiting for it to go back to my original price and take out, take it, um, take profits, right? Just close it out green in the very beginning, opening market hours, stress-free. Okay.
Uh, and yeah, you do have a possibility of getting those shares assigned if, for example, BLNK closed at $33 or whatever, then I would get assigned on, on, on that. Uh, if, if a spread, or sorry, not if a spread, if an option is in the money, the brokerage will always automatically execute it. Um, and then you'll get assigned. So that's how it works. If it's out of the money, that's a different story. Usually you won't get assigned, but there is still a chance because uh, in that case, it's up to the, the other user on the other end who uh, bought the options you sold if they want to exercise it or not. But if it's in the money by at least one cent, a brokerage will always automatically exercise it on behalf of that individual. So that's, that's why you always get assigned uh, in that case. All right. Um, okay, so be positive. Yeah, this video will also be available to watch later. It's available for two weeks on Twitch. And uh, I, I do eventually plan on like cleaning these videos up and then uploading them onto YouTube or onto our Xtrades hub, uh, which is being developed right now. It's our website. Uh, eventually, it will be full featured. We, you filled at open in Thursday and closed at 30% on Friday. Uh, I think you meant where you where you filled that open in Thursday and closed at thirty percent on Friday, right? So I opened I opened the ER calendar spread on Thursday, about thirty minutes before the close, and that's usually my typical um, how I execute that strategy, right? I, I usually do within an hour before close. That's when I start looking at it and I start trying to get into the play, and then yeah, I just set a limit sell after market hours with um, about thirty percent. And then I just let it execute. In fact, I set my limit sell at a dollar twenty, but my brokerage, Tastyworks, filled me at a dollar twenty, a uh, dollar twenty-seven, or was it twenty-nine? Kind of forgot. But uh, anyways, yeah, I, I just let it automatically get filled. Out of all the ERs every day, how do you select which stocks to make moves on? So great question. Uh, and let's just take a look at these guidelines real quick, okay? I, I did have a, you know, an older uh, seminar video. Our first seminar video was on ER calendar spreads. And I, you know, I'd recommend you to go look at it, but it's not up anymore. So Twitch took it down because uh, it was past the two weeks. And I haven't uploaded it to YouTube yet. And that's why, actually why I'm doing this today. Uh, but let's look at the guidelines here, right? So whenever I take an ER calendar spread, the first thing I look for is IV skew. I need an IV skew greater than 100%. Now, these are just general guidelines. I've also taken ER calendar spreads where the skew was smaller, maybe 50 to 80%. Uh, but I generally find that if I pick something with an IV skew higher than 100%, my rate of success significantly increases. So now I just only do it if I have something better than 100%. Uh, it's, it's just better probability for me. And what is IV skew? So, um, or I guess what is IV, right? Implied volatility, right? So a one of the in extrinsic values of an options contract is implied volatility. It's what the markets are pricing in to happen to a stock ticker or what people think might happen. And then when there's a lot of interest in a particular contract, IV goes up. It, so it's reflective of interest in a particular option, and that's what drives some of the premium price, right? So what I'm looking for in SKU is that I'm looking for a very high IV on the front dated option that I am selling, because you always want to sell high IV, and then you want to buy low IV, because that means that the, the high IV that you're selling has less of a chance of actually making as big of a move as people are expecting. And so the IV skew is I'm just comparing the front dated options IV with the back dated option IV. If it's greater than 100% difference in that IV skew, then I take that ER play. Or I consider it. I, I, I also look at other things. So the other considerations here is that it has weekly options and decent liquidity. So this goes, this, this goes hand in hand. 
if a particular stock has good volume, good liquidity, then chances are more likely that it will have weekly options. If they only have monthly options, chances are that it's not traded as heavily. And so I'm not as interested in trading that because usually um, it's harder to get into the spreads. And also there, there's not as much interest in that stock. So there's not as much uh, premium crushing that I can take advantage of. I also want to make sure that a stock has a decent market cap. So like there's tons of, of ERs every single day, right? Um, you know, we're getting to that point of the season where there's not as many good ERs anymore. Like, you know, we're always looking for the high profile companies, right? Uh, <laughs> I've had times where I've played like really, really low price tickers or penny type tickers with this kind of strategy and it does not work very well. I find that, you know, it does work, but then it's more lottery than, um, picking something that's bigger and, you know, it's already a big risk when you're doing ERs, but when you're picking small cap penny tickers, like the move sometimes really, really far outweighs what happens. And I just take a big loss on that. And so I've decided this is one of my guidelines is that I only play something if it has, you know, more than a billion dollar market cap at least, right? Uh, but anyways, I usually look for more higher profile companies, et cetera, in order to play these. Uh, for also for ER calendar spreads, you will find that you have greater success towards the end of the week. So you can do this anytime from Monday to Friday, right? But usually Thursday to Friday, I find myself to have a greater probability of success and also in addition, a greater profitability. So just higher um, percent ratios. And the biggest reason for this is because of data again. So as options get closer to expiration, uh, the data that's the data burn, right? The premium that's being eaten up by data increases. So uh, because we are short, right? We're short on the closer data option. We are actually, you know, um, I, I, th I don't even know if I'm using these terms correctly anymore, but we're, we're long data, right? <laughs> yeah, we are long data. Uh, but basically we're trying to take advantage of data burning up. So um, the premiums. And so that's why we see greater success towards the end of the week. Thursday to Friday are the most optimal place. But I do have success with this strategy on Monday to Friday as well, but I have to be more selective. Definitely look at those IV schemes, right? Uh, so, and then my next recommendation is if these are always lottos because ERs, anything can happen. Just because options usually IV crash after ER and most of the time they, you know, don't pan out for those holders of options, sometimes there is crazy move after ER. And in those cases, that's where the strategy will lose. Most of the time, I expect that, you know, there's not as much movement as people are pricing into those options. And that's why we take these plays. But because there's always a chance of that happening, always, always, always size in the similarly. And, um, you know, the more you do it, the more chances of being profitable your account is. Don't just all in your account on these kinds of plays. Split it up, you know, and, and most, you know, do 10% of your account on, on this play. So you can do it 10 times and then, you know, maybe you, you fail four times out of 10, but then the other six are successes and then you get 30% on that and it helps outweigh those losses, right? Uh, and then my last rule is, of course, limit sell for 30% before open. And I kind of explained why I did that already. It's just less risky less stress for me and 30% is a great overnight trade. Like how many people can say that, you know, you, you take a trade 10, 15 minutes before close and then next morning you wake up and you find out that you have 30% more. Like there's nothing, you know, that's a great thing. That's amazing. Right. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy with 30% and um, it's a profitable strategy for me. That's what I like to do. Okay. So that's it for my ER calendar spread guidelines. Uh, now we're just going to go into the actual seminar. Um, okay, so I see some questions, so I'm just following up on those. Uh, Kate and Queen, Queen Cars, um, where do you usually set your stop or do you have a stop, et cetera? Uh, yes. So for these plays, uh, 
normally I don't set stops. And the reason is because they are ER calendar spreads. I just let them run. So, it, you know, if, if um, the play doesn't pan out, I just let it run and I give it time. And the reason is because time is actually on our side for these plays, because remember, we are long data. So the closer we get to the end of the week, the higher the chance of our profitability is, as long as it doesn't move away from our strike, right? So if it moves really far away from our strike, then at that point, my, my contract isn't worth that much anymore. So I usually just, I just let them go. Um, but, you know, as I, did, as I said, uh, usually... I limit myself for 30% before open, right? But I have gotten 100% plays on these before as well. And I just let it, the front data option expire. And then it went back in the money before my second option expired. And I actually made a profit on it. Um, gee, what's, a, what's an example of this? I know I did one last month that I alerted in the chat that did this. What was it? Oh yeah, it was Cody, C C O T Y. <laughs> so that that play was deep red on the next day because it dropped. I don't remember how much it dropped anymore, but it dropped like 20, 30 percent of its value. And this is one reason why I don't like to play tickers that have um a low stock price anymore. But it basically dropped so far down it was worth nothing. So I let the front date option expire worthless, which is fine, because that basically means we collected the full premium. And then I let the long date option run. And then by the time we reached back to that long date option, it was actually in the money, and then we took profit on that play. So it doesn't always work out like that, but I this is how I treat these plays, is that they're ER calendar spreads. I treat them as lottos. And, uh, you know, my account for ER calendar spread, the strategy is about up 25%. So, you know, obviously I have a limit sell for 30% normally. Uh, that means I do have losses, but, you know, my gains far outweigh my losses. And usually um, this is strategy is successful. So, but, you know, if, if you really need a limit, like a, a stop loss, maybe something like 50% would be reasonable is what I think. Or, or you can set it lower to say it's say the same as your limit sell. You can do 30%. Um, but I treat them as lottos, and that's how I play them. Can you do this strategy with a small account? Yes, you can. Because spreads are cheap. Uh, and, and for example, the play that we took this week was only, what, 80, 89 cents? So that's $89. Like, you know, you could play play one uh, spread on that right for eighty nine dollars, and that's less than ten percent of your account. Maybe you can do two, right? Uh, probably wouldn't do more than that, but you know, probably one is best uh, on a small account, right? Um, but they're they're cheaper to play. They are risky though because it's still ER. I just find that I have good success with it. Um, over eighty percent win rate on this strategy, but that's only when I'm following these criteria, right? You, you need to make sure that you're meeting these criteria in order to increase that probability of success. Um, okay. All right. Let's move on. Uh, we'll more Q and A later. If you guys have any questions, if we have time. Uh, so we're gonna go over the main point of this seminar, which is legging in. So what is a leg? All right. So a leg is each call or put option that is part of a more complex strategy with multiple option contracts. So usually you hear people go, oh, "I'm oh, I'm buying calls or I'm buying puts," or maybe some people are selling them instead, and they're they're selling puts, for example, right? So that's just a, a single leg and a naked leg, for example. And, uh, you know, with multiple legs, that's what we call spreads, right? So when we have a spread, we're basically reducing our risk or covering ourselves up with different option contracts in order to create a more complex strategy. And there's a lot of different reasons why you would use a more complex strategy because they, they adopt to other different situations. Calls and puts, it's just bullish or bearish, right? With complex strategies, you can be neutral as well, or you can just be um, neutral bullish or neutral bearish, right? Depending on how you mix up your options. So when we open each part of advanced strategy or complex strategy separately, for example, a spread where you buy to open something and you sell to open something else, right? 
you can do each separately and that's what we call legging in. So example of that here is legging into a trade such as an iron condor. Okay. Um, I, I think I'm going to just show you guys a uh, option strat, the calculator, and so you guys can visually see this as well uh, in one second. But, uh, you know, an iron condor would be to sell a put spread into a down move, right? So um, the reason you do that is because when it drops and then you sell the put spread, and then you wait to sell the call spread after the stock runs back up. So you're taking advantage of the price difference within the stock by legging in to a trade, okay? So why would you or why would you not want to leg into a trade? Uh, and before we get into that, let me just quickly hop over to our option strat calculator. Uh, this is an iron butterfly, not what I was looking for. So this is optionstrat.com. Um, it is free to use, but recently they created a pay plan or subscription plan uh, and they lock some features behind it. Uh, but, you know, you can still use some of the basic features. So let's look at the Iron Condor. Uh, this is the AMC Iron Condor. So in the Iron Condor, it's a neutral strategy, right? Let's just read what it says here. Uh, Iron Condor is a neutral strategy. It's profitable when the stock remains within the inner strikes, B and C. Uh, it is established as a net credit. In other words, I am a net seller. So instead of paying money for this trade, I'm receiving money for this trade, right? At open. Um, the downside is, of course, if, if it doesn't pan out, you have to pay, right? So your max loss on this trade is $135 because that's the width of uh, your iron condors, right? So you have 6P and 8P, and then you have 12 and 14. So 12 minus, or 14 minus 12 is 2, and 8 minus 6 is 2, so that's your max loss, right? That's um, the max value of this is $200. So your max loss is $135 because I'm receiving a net credit of $65. So that's that's why it's $200. Uh, 200 minus $135 is $65. Uh, I don't really feel like explaining iron condors right now, but just to give you guys a, a brief idea of that, right? Um, okay. So in iron condor, you want the, the trade to remain between uh, your two price points, and that's how you make sure that you collect your max profits. Okay. So you're risking $135 to make $65. Uh, as long as AMC remains between, actually it tells you right here, $735 and $1265. Normally, I think of it remaining between 8 and 12 right? We want it to be between our two spreads that we opened up, uh, but because we got a $65 dollar credit and that's why we have um this extra extra distance right so when you leg into a iron condor what what we are saying that you would do is that you would uh you would buy to open the 6p and then you would sell to open the 8p right so the 6p is worth less because it's further out of the money and the 8P is closer in the money, so it's worth more, right? So that's why you're getting a net credit. In an iron condor, both of these, are you receive a net credit because you're buying the one further out, which is worth less. And then you're selling the one closer in, which is worth more. So you get, you get a net credit from that, and your max loss is whenever this is past 14 or below 6 for AMC. We just want it to stay in between here. So uh, the reason why you do these uh, 6P and 14C, even though they're like worth not that much, is to limit your loss. Because otherwise, if I just sold this 8P for 43 cents and AMC goes to zero dollars, which I don't think will happen, but let's just say that happens, or I don't know, they file for bankruptcy, something like that, right? Then now you're on the hook for $800. So I collected 43 cents and, and I had to pay $800, which is terrible. So you, you do iron condors to help reduce that risk. Because now you have a 6P. So now if it's zero dollars, then this 6P is going to be worth $600 and this is worth $800, right? So that's $200. That's how you get your max loss. Uh, sorry if this, guy's, if this is really basic for you and 
again, sorry if this is too advanced for you. Uh, just trying to quickly explain this. Um, I probably am going to have to do a more detailed an actual seminar on, on each of these strategies later. Uh, but yeah. All right. So uh, in the event of legging in, what, you, what they're telling you to do, or what I'm saying that you can do, for legging into an iron condor is, say that AMC is at $10 right now. It says 10.22, so it's 10.22, right? So, and you expect AMC to drop, okay, in the short term. But you expect that, say, by April 16th, AMC is going to be between 8 or 7.35 to 12.65. That's where you think that it will end. You think it will end maybe exactly at $10, because that's the point of this iron condo. You want it to be right in the middle. That's how you collect max profit, right? Uh, or between 12 and uh, 8, right? Because as your break even is, is further out, because of the premium collected. So you collect max profits if it's between uh, 12 and 8. So you want it to be right smack in between these. So if AMC drops to $8 or something, and then you see support there, and you think it's going to bounce, that's where you would open up this iron condor, this put side of the spread. Because if AMC is at $8, this AP is going to be worth more, right? This 6P will also be worth more, but the AP will be is closer in the money, right? So it'll be worth the increase uh, will be higher um, because of the delta, right? And delta is just a change in in the price of the contract uh, for every single dollar that the underlying contract moves. All right. Um, I, I know I explained about Greeks before as well, but you know if you don't know the Greeks, look them up. Uh, they are important, <laughs> but basically higher delta. So this AP is is going to be worth more than this XP when AMC is at eight dollars. So the, and then you expect it to bounce, and then that's where you open this credit spread. So let's just say, for example, that AP is going to be worth I don't know one dollar, and this six P is going to be worth thirty cents. So now I'm collecting a seventy cent credit instead of a what it, whatever it is right now, which is thirty one cents, right? For example. So it'll be worth more. So you get 70 cents of credit. And then now you think it's going to bounce, so you just wait. And then you see it bounce all the way up to $12. And you're like, oh, okay, so now you do the same thing, and you open the other side of your iron condor. But at the end of the day, on April 16th, you think AMC is going to be between 8 and 12. But now you collected more than $65 of credit by opening each side of the trade separately because you took advantage of the movement. Whereas if you just opened it straight up, you would just take... Uh, 65 credit right now and that is fine uh, I just want to illustrate this point here but why would you or why would you not want to do this okay let's get into that and I'm going to follow up with chat real quick right now one second uh, all right Let's see. Can you sell an option before market opens? No, but you can set a limit sell order before the market opens. Uh, I see a spindle blood already answered that. Thank you. <laughs> um, all right. This is just test 19. Uh, so we are doing call credit spreads and put credit spreads, two credit spreads on the same expiry. That is correct. So an iron call is two credit spreads combined together. A put credit spread and a, uh, uh, a call credit spread. And so, you know, one is bullish and one is bearish, but combining both of them, you end up with a neutral strategy where you want it to expire in the middle of those spreads. I'll have to play around with it. So, okay. Uh, so I assume you generally want to pick a lower delta for the legs you're selling because that means less likelihood of expiring in the money. Uh, that's that's kind of true, right? Um, but usually we look for something between 25, maybe 20 to 45 delta is, is what's generally recommended by the pros, right? Um, and, you know, I find good success with that as well. Uh, but, you know, if I see something on the chart, I'm going to play off my chart rather than just base off of those values alone, right? But it is something I do consider when I make a trade on those things. Um, you know, because you want to balance not just 
chance of it happening, but also the risk and reward ratio, right? Like the less chance it has of happening, the less you're going to collect on it if you are selling uh, a particular contract or selling a credit or credit, right? So if the delta is really low, there is probably not going to hit and you're going to just collect the premium. But at the same time, you might just be collecting like one or two dollars, right? Like it's too far, so far out of the money, no one wants to buy it. So you have to find that balance and 25 20 to 45 is is usually why here recommended by the pros and i find pretty good success with that as well okay let's go to the legging in uh so when or when do you want to or not want to leg into a trade so we kind of talked about that a little bit already when i went over that iron condor right you can take advantage of intraday price movement on a stock before you open the full leg, right? Or, or not the full leg, the full uh, complex strategy, right? Um, pros, right? So going over the basics, when you open a complex strategy, you have multiple legs, okay? Now, every single leg has a spread, right? And that spread, I mean like the bid ask spread. So like if, for example, you're trading SPY, which is really, really liquid most of the time, you can pick any option contract on SPY and it probably has like a one, two cent gap, right? So say, for example, I'm taking, I don't know, 400 C SPY for April 1st or something. And it's, uh, I don't know, three, three dollars. Uh, that's what the bid is at. And the ask is at three dollars and two cents. Okay, I don't know if that's what the values actually are, but usually that's what you'll notice. They have very, very small width. Now, if I am doing a spread on SPY instead, say that I'm buying April 1st, 400C, and I'm selling, I don't know, 405C, and now that spread has increased. Because now, if each of those contracts has a one or two cent width between the bid and the ask, now your total width is actually between one to four cents right and now this is for a really liquid contract it's like spy which you can get filled really easily when you have a more complex strategy the more legs you add in and if they're not that liquid like if for example if you look at something like tesla which is which is actually pretty liquid uh usually but they have pretty wide spreads right on tesla i regularly see something like a dollar width between the bid and ask it's not unusual for to see see that um and on less liquid uh, contracts, you can see even wider spreads. So once you start adding up all these different legs into your play, and they all have these wide widths in their um, bid and ask, you're adding up the difference between them. And now you suddenly have, say, a few dollar width in your play. And so say that you, you know, um, your width is between $1 and $4 for, for a spread that you're taking. And then you're like, well, the middle, which is fair price is maybe about $2, right? $2.50 or something. So you put that in and then you don't get filled because your bit and the ass is so far apart. Your broker is having a hard time finding someone to fill both of those contracts at the same time for those prices that you want. So uh, you'll find that this happens a lot. And this is especially true of those ER calendar spreads that I mentioned. This is why even though the strategy works really well for me, why I don't even see anyone mention this online. Like whenever I look up calendar spreads, no one talks about this. Like when I look up ER calendar spreads, I found one instance of it in in a Reddit dated back like an year ago or something. But I never hear anyone talk about it. But the spreads are really hard to fill. Uh, so what happens then? Do you just keep increasing your limits to try to get filled really quickly, or what do you do, or or do you just wait? Um, so my recommendation is, you know, general recommendation is probably, you know, you can increase the limit a little bit, but not too much. Because if you do that, you're basically shooting yourself in the foot by paying overpriced before the trade even happens. And you already lost money the moment that you open the trade. Um, so this is where legging in comes in, right? So when you leg into a complex strategy, you can take each of those plays separately. So your broker doesn't have to try to find people who are selling those contracts at those exact prices that you want. And then, you know, it takes a long time to fill. So by opening them separately, you can usually get in faster, right? And it's also easier to find uh, 
because it's easier for them to find people to fill one contract as opposed to multiple contracts all at the same time. Uh, and also, in addition to that, sometimes this would be less expensive because, again, with those bid, wide bid ask spreads, um, you know, it's, it's, it's just easier to fill. You can probably get a better price instead of having to rate, keep raising your limit uh, on those spreads. And using this kind of a method of legging in is great, especially if the market, I mean, if you feel like you can time the market. Uh, but if you cannot, then this method will underperform. And going back to our example of that AMC Iron Condor we mentioned earlier, uh, you know, we opened the put credit spread. In other words, it's, it's bullish, right? It's a bullish put spread because um, we're selling. We're not sellers of those uh, puts. In that case, you know, we we open those when and after AMC has already dropped to support and we expect to bounce up from there. So that's when we would go, okay, now I'm going to open my put spread. I expect it to bounce from here. And then once it bounces, you're like, okay, this is resistance. Uh, it's at resistance. I am going to open my um, call credit spread, which is bearish, right? And now you have both of those combined together to create a neutral strategy. And you're like, it's just going to range in between these two uh, spreads. And then I will make max profit. And again, the difference between that is, is, is significant if you can time the market. But if, for example, instead you open the spread, uh, your put spread, and it keeps dropping instead, then suddenly you, are, you shot yourself in your foot, and then you can't open up the other side of your trade because it just keeps dropping or um, something like that, for example. uh let's see let me let me take a look at uh options chat i mean not options chat um the stream chat again how easy or hard are these to fill uh you know it just depends on what you're trading like as i said if you're trying to fill on spy it's really easy to fill because spy is really really liquid in general but some tickers are really hard and especially those er calendar spread plays usually i find find it um it's pretty difficult to do. Uh, I was told another group to never lick out of, out of a trade. Is that true? I'm going to be going over that later. Um, so just stay tuned for that. Uh, yeah, and I agree with Spindleblood on trading spreads in Robinhood. The fills are, are not that great on Robinhood. Robinhood is like the bottom of the barrel on the list of um, brokers to fill. Uh, and and you know it is you pay for for what you get right or you get what you pay for right that, that, i said that backwards um but yeah i prefer to use tastyworks um and they do charge 65 cents right but and i know you know tos right tda whatever is pretty standard 65 cents pretty standard um but yeah, I mean, you, you know, you pay for you pay for what you uh, get, right? Uh, I I do do spreads on Robinhood too, but you will have a harder time getting into them. So, what are the cons of legging in? So, if you can get into a spread at a lower cost or more quickly, why wouldn't you always want to leg into the trade? And that is because of the risk and the spirit of the trade. So we kind of already talked about this uh, earlier, where like, basically you're not, you know, you think you can time the market, but then you fail at timing the market, right? Um, there's always a chance of that happening. The risk of legging in or the leg risk is that, uh, you know, market price and one or more of the desired legs will become unfavorable during the time it takes to complete the various orders, right? Because you're opening them all separately, the market is moving while you're making those separate orders. And if it moves outside of what you expect, instead of becoming more profitable or getting in cheaper, you end up paying more. So, you know, the thing is, the most important thing is when you're doing a complex strategy, you have a certain goal in mind, right? Like when I'm opening an iron condor, the purpose of me opening an iron condor is because I am neutral, right? I'm neutral on a particular stock. I want it to stay within a certain range. And that is my play. Like that, 
that's like the point of my play. I I don't you know I don't want it to move much, right? If it moves wildly or moves really far out of that range, then you know why was I considering doing an iron condor in the first place, right? If it's so volatile, right? Um, <laughs> so that's what I mean by the spur of the trade. There's a reason you're taking a certain complex strategy. If you're not trying to use, you know, the purpose of that complex strategy, which is in the case of an iron corner, I'm trying to be neutral, then maybe you should just take, you know, naked puts or, or naked calls. Like if I'm bearish on it, why don't I, I, I just take puts? And then you'll make more money that way anyways. Higher risk, higher reward, right? If you want to reduce the risk on that, you can just do a, do a put spread instead, right? Like a put debit spread. So, uh, you know, when you're doing a complex strategy, I'm aiming for a specific outcome. Why leg into a strategy like that if, you know, that's not what I'm trying to do at all? So, um, you know, th there is risk to legging in. So, simple question for you guys. Think about it. Uh, say that you're waking up in the morning and then you're like, okay, I'm going to put on these, these pair of pants today. Maybe you just jump into your pants, both legs in, or, or do you put one leg in and one leg out? Okay. <laughs> so I don't, I don't do put on both legs at the same time, right? <laughs> now, unfortunately, that doesn't make any sense in the terms of option strategy because it's a complete opposite. <laughs> we actually do want to uh, put on both legs at the same time. So general consensus on legging in. If you go look anywhere online and you go look at any reputable trader, the consensus on legging in is no. You don't really want to leg in. But people agree that sometimes maybe there are certain situations where you do want to leg in. Like if it's really, really hard to get a fill on a spread you can't get in, then maybe you can consider it. But here's the issue with doing that um other than what i mentioned earlier right so you you have that downside risk like you you could end up flopping on your trade instead right before you enter in the other side of your leg um and you know i just lost my train of thought i'll get back down that later and we'll just go to the next slide sorry about that uh so when do i leg in so this is an example of what i did Uh, can you please show an example to make it more clear? Okay. Yep, I'm doing that right now. So I always show actual examples, but you know, just let me get through through the stuff, right? Uh, when do I leg in? This is a Tesla vertical spread that I legged in on Robinhood. So you notice here that this spread is um, Tesla 675 March 12 puts. So this is a weekly. So I was looking for a very quick day trade, right? So I opened the 675 puts on March 10th uh, for $1,000.180. That's why you see this uh, minus here, right? Because I, I paid for this contract, okay? Where's my mouse? I lost my mouse. Oh, here it is. $1,180, okay. So then later, I completed my vertical spread by selling the 665 puts for the same week, same expiration, on the same day, later in that day, for $2,000. Now, you might notice something weird, right? <laughs> or maybe it's not so weird, because you know you probably know what I did. Now, normally when you take a 675 puts in the 665 sell, right, that means that I'm taking a, this This is considered a debit spread, right? Uh, let me let me just pull up the, the calculator again so you can you can see more visually. Let's pull up Tesla. And, you know, obviously March 12th is already expired, so it's not on, on this anymore, but we'll just do April 16th just to give you an idea. So we're going to do a... Uh, uh, bear put spread. Bear put spread, right? So let's do April 1st for no particular reason. So let's say that... You know, I, I buy to open a 640p for $33.78, and then I uh, I sell the 620p for $22.25. So my net debit for this spread is a dollar, uh, sorry, $1,000.153, and my max profit is $847, because the width between these two is 
dollars, right? So twenty times one hundred is two hundred or uh, two thousand. Sorry, and then you you subtract um, what you actually paid for it. So I paid a thousand hundred fifty dollars for it. So that means my max profit is eight hundred forty seven dollars, right? So this this graph shows that visually. You know, once you pass six hundred, you you hit max profit, right? Or six six twenty. Sorry. So in the case of um, why I, I did is you notice here that I bought the closer in the money puts for a thousand hundred eighty, and I sold the six sixty five for more than what I bought the six seventy five for. Normally, you have to pay. Or a spread right so this is where you come get the advantages of legging into a trade so in this case what i did was i waited for tesla to drop that day let's try to go back to that day uh i think it was march 10th let's try to find that my computer is definitely lagging on my end with all the stuff I have open. I can feel it. But okay, March 10th. How March 10th? All right, so this is March 10th. It, it gapped up. Um, and then I took, I took, I remember now, uh, that day I actually uh, woke up in the morning at 6 30 a.m. I am Pacific time, right? 6 30 a.m. Didn't have work that day. So I, I looked at the market and I saw that Tesla was up here at, at 715 or something. And I had this resistance line for Tesla at 710. Okay. And I, I knew that Tesla had previously rejected around 717 or so because of what happened on uh, earlier the month in March 1st. Okay. So when I saw it hit the 710 area, let's get a one hour chart. So maybe you can see a little bit better here what, where, I'm, where I got that from. So 710 is right here. So uh, the reason why I have 710 mark is because it was a gap. So on 22nd of February, Tesla gapped down from uh, 710 to about 695 or so, right? So there's, there's this gap here between this candle and this candle. And, and then, of course, the next day it filled the gap and it rejected. Okay, so let's ignore that for now. The only thing I care about here is I marked this as a potential resistance area because uh, it was a previous gap area and it had previously rejected there, right? So I was looking for it to hold and uh, going back to the more zoomed in chart again, we have the tenth over here. So I know I popped over it, but I knew that it had uh, Tesla had done that before over here and then it it rejected right like it popped up a little bit over 710 and maybe five to ten dollars more and then it started going down so i opened that's when i opened that tesla put on um uh, what was it was 675 i think go back 675 yep i opened 675 puts for a thousand hundred eighty dollars in the morning at about 635 ish 640 something like that um and then I targeted 675. The reason why is because, again, I have this support and resistance line here. So you see this uh, yellow line right here it is 675.9. So my target was actually, you know, 676, but I was like, 675 is good. I'm, I'm just going to take that. Um, and you might be wondering where that 675 was. So we have this gap right here. So this was where... Uh, high of the day on that gap down day so that's why i use 675 and then you also see that it acted as a uh, support here temporarily before and it acted as a resistance the previous day right here so i knew that this range right here 675 to 660 was a really really good bounce range for tesla you know it, it did that a lot right it kept trading over here so i was like you know maybe it might go down to you know 660 or something later in the day but you know 675 was my first target and so that's what i did so I, I set that, I, I opened it, the trade for $1,188 or so, uh, whatever I said in that screenshot. And you know what I did? I felt really, really tired. I didn't have work that day. So I was like, you know, I'm, I'm just going to go back to bed. <laughs> I, I think I stayed up till like 1 or 2 a.m. The, the previous, um, that morning, actually, and I was trading crypto or something. <laughs> so I, I just wanted to go back to sleep, right? I was really tired. Uh, 
So what I did was, you know, I'm going to set <laughs> a limit sell on 665p for $2,000 or $20. And the reason why I said that again was because I expected, you know, I thought it was high chance that we would reach here. And I thought there was even higher chance that we would break down into back down here into 660. But I was pretty sure 660 would act as support. And that's, that is actually what Tesla did that day. You see on March 10th, they went from here to here and it bounced, right? So I was looking for this, but I was like, okay, maybe I'll do 665. So it's slightly uh, closer in the money than 660 because maybe we won't go all the way down here. And uh, so I just said to 665 and I was like, why $2,000? Cause I was just like, you know, yeah, I don't know. I just said it because it was a nice round number. And I was like, you know, if it, if it actually moves down here to 675, um, it will be more than, um, it will be worth more than that. And you can actually check that out using this calculator here. So if you, if you go to like long, uh, long put, for example, right here, and, and you look at 620p, right? So if I fix 620p, then you can look at this chart. So today, say for example, today is March 29th. It's not, um, but say that this was a market open on, on Monday, right? March 29th. And, and it's right now, this contract is to, er, it's $4,000. Okay. Uh, I need to change this to be the contract value. So let's look at that contract value. So let's say it's, it's uh, $4,200 right now. And I'm like, okay, I, I see resistance or not resistance. I see support for Tesla at say, I don't know, 590. So if, if I expect Tesla to go down to 590, then I look at this chart. I'm like, okay, so uh, this calculator is predicting based on the Greeks, right? Because the Greeks is how the options derive their value from, right? So it's all calculated. If Tesla is at 590, then the contract is going to be worth $55.61. So I'm like, okay, well, I'm, I'm expected to hit somewhere there during the later in the day. So I'm going to set a limit sell or I, I'm going to undercut it a little bit because maybe we don't hit that, right? Or maybe this, this is not exact, right? So I'm going to set it for $54 or something. And I'm like, that's, you know, $12, $1,200 profit. That's, that's fine. I'm okay with that. Uh, I think that's great profit. You know, always take money when you can take it. Um, you know, don't, don't just sit on your, on your whims and let them turn red, right? It, it's not your money until you take profits. So set those limit cells. And that's what I did. And then I woke up like two hours later or something. And I found out that my spread filled and, and the rest is history. So I basically got a free running spread because I bought it at 1,180. I sold the further output for $2,000. That means I already made $820 off for opening this spread. So I'm already green on the trade. And now I just have this spread left over. Uh, and this spread can be worth 675 minus 665, right? Ten dollars, so one thousand dollars. In other words, my max profit now is eight hundred twenty plus one thousand. So I could have, pro I can profit a total of one thousand eight hundred twenty dollars on Tesla as long as it closes below six sixty five on March twelfth, or it goes below that before that, right? And so, this is an example of when I do leg in. I only leg in when I am day trading. And I leg into vertical spreads, either bulls, bull sides with calls or put sides with puts. And the reason why I do these, do this is just to de-risk myself, right? Because when you're day trading, things are very volatile. Ask anyone, um, you know, the chat room this past week was wild, right? We saw SPY, QQQ, whatever. It doesn't matter what stock you're looking at, Baidu, right? You saw them go up and down huge amounts this past week so let's take a look at Baidu right <laughs> so Baidu right uh yesterday was the the 26th so it opened up over here or er, let me try to find it right here at about 2 202 ish something like that 205 I don't know around there and then throughout the day what happened to Baidu? It dropped all the way down to like 170. It bounced off the 200 um, daily SMA, which is this yellow line right here. Uh, but it, it dropped, you know, 30 plus dollars. More than that. Uh, a little bit more than that. But, you know, that's that's a lot. That's 
you know, like 15% or something on a $200 plus stock. Like this is not a small penny stock, right? Invited drop $30. $30. That's huge. And then what happened? And then it bounced back all the way back up. Another $30. And it actually closed the day green, right? Uh, up 2%. So th that's, that's really insane. So this whole past week has been very, very volatile for the market. It's like been moving up and down a crazy amount. Um, and Baidu is just one example that I remember a lot of people talking about. Uh, I also traded Baidu, but anyways. Doing this, this kind of a strategy allows me to de-risk. So say that, you know, Baidu drops all the way down to 170 and I am still bearish on Baidu, right? Say that it drops down to 170 and I'm still bearish, but I open my trade really early on in the day, so I'm really green, right? Should I take profits or not? But let's just say that I'm really bearish still, and I still think it can go down further. So I'm like, oh, maybe it will go down to 164, which is this, uh, I have this fib here, right? 164. Um, in reality, it, it tried to bounce off the 200 daily SMA. But let's just say that I was looking for 165 because of this fib line over here, and I see this action over here, and it kind of bounced up off of that before. And I'm like, okay, maybe there, there's support here at 165, and it's going down to 165. So at that point, you know, what you should do, right, if you don't want to exit, completely exit your puts play on a day trade, right, then you would just sell a further um, out-of-the-money strike on the puts, just like what I did with Tesla. And I say that I sell, you know, I see support here. I'm like, okay, I'm going to sell 165p on Baidu. And, you know... I, what I prefer to do actually is I prefer to find a strike that is worth more than what I paid for for my original strike. So I have a free running spread. So that's what I would do. Um, and if you had done that, then when Baidu rocketed back up all the way up to, you know, green for the day, you would have lost money, right? But you would have already locked in partial profits and you wouldn't have to suffer as much because your trade is still green. You just wouldn't be as green, even though it's above where you originally entered the trade. And that's the advantage of legging into these vertical spreads. And that's pretty much the only time I like to leg in. Uh, so usually it's just when I'm trying to de-risk and I want to stay in a play, I'm still bearish on Baidu, for example. I don't want to miss out, but at the same time, like it's dropped a lot. I see that it's really close to 200 daily SMA. Maybe it bounces off of there. Maybe it breaks down and it keeps going down to 165. I still feel bearish, but you know, there's some risk here. Maybe there, it finds support here, or maybe maybe I was looking at this FIB line right here, um, this earlier one. I think this is a 0 0.5 FIB, uh, and it bounces off of that, which it actually did, and then it broke, right? But but you know, if you want to de-risk, that's what you do. You 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 convert your naked play into a spread and that the risk yourself, you can take profits, you can still stay in the trade and still be directional on it, but you don't, you just don't, um, if it like completely plummets, obviously you don't make as much, but you still make some money. And the important part about trading really is knowing when to take profits and actually taking profits. Because if you didn't do that, and you were in Baidu puts for that day, you would have gotten wiped out from this move where it literally dropped $30 and it went back up $40, right? You, you don't want to be on that in that situation. So, you know, make sure to take profits when you can. All right. Uh, and then, of course, day trading on a PDT account, so pattern day trading account, or you have an under 25K margin account. So if, if you know, you're limited to three day trades in any given five rolling day uh, uh, trading period, right? If you're under 25K on a margin account, or if you're on PDT, you can't even do that because you're already restricted and they don't let you day trade, right? So in this situation, if you want to take, you know, these riskier weekly plays or day trade, et cetera, you can't really do that. But with this strategy, you can, because what you're doing is you're just locking out your profits by using a different strike. And because it is a different strike, it's not considered a day trade because it's not the same, quote unquote, not the exact same, um, uh, what do you call it, product, right? So 675 is not the same as a 665. It's still on Tesla, but this lets you get around those PT restrictions. Okay. Um, gonna follow up with chat real quick here and see if you guys got any questions for me.
what is the shortest call or put option you can have? Yes, you can have a zero, uh, a zero. We call them zero DTE, which is zero days to expire. So you you can take same day expiries, but it depends on your broker. Uh, but I do think that you know, Robinhood used to not let you do that, but they have started recently allowing you to do zero DTEs. Obviously, they're much higher risk, right? Um, high chance of going to zero. In fact, that's what happens to most of them. Uh, you know, if you if you're a day trader. They can be great if you're a scalper they're great but if you are more like me and a swing trader uh you know i might play them sometimes but i don't focus too much on zero day to, uh sorry zero day to expire trades ex unless i am selling it so i like doing like calendars or stuff like that or diagonals where i buy a further out option and i sell the zero day option so I can collect the premium on it because usually zero days to expire options that will expire worthless at the end of the day. Now, if you're just trading intraday movement, they can still be really, really profitable, right? Like, for example, this week, we know that I do went crazy, spy went crazy, things like that, right? They will also chance to make profits with those zero days to expire options. In your Tesla example, did you close both legs at the same time to take profit? Great question. Otherwise known as a ghetto spread. <laughs> Welcome, Royastad. Glad to see you here. But yep, I call them ghetto spreads. Uh, and it's because you're not opening them at the same time. Uh, but yeah, generally speaking, you know, it's not recommended to leg into trades. But the one time that I do leg into trades is when I do these vertical spreads when I'm actually day trading and I'm just trying to take profits. And I still want to remain in a trade. Um, or for example, if you want to swing something overnight, but you don't want to risk as much because you know anything can happen overnight. It can like pop up, drop down, whatever. Anything can happen. Uh, doing this is also a great way to swing trade and de-risk yourself after you caught the initial move. Next slide here. Uh, and this will answer your question about closing both legs at the same time. Um, okay. Oh, looks like I left a bunch of slides in here from last time. Uh, we talked about debit spreads and stuff. Uh, if you guys are you know interested in reading more about that or you're not that familiar with these kinds of strategies, because the, all the plays that we talked about um, on Tesla, you know, that's a debit spread, right? But I'll leave these slides in here. You guys can take a look at that later if um, from the recorded video, if you guys need to review that. But I won't go over them in detail. Okay, so you got vertical spreads here, bull side, bear side, right? Puts and calls, credits, debits. Uh, these are all just slides from the last seminar, uh, just in case anybody wanted to see those. Okay, back to, to slides for today's seminar. So legging in is a no in general, right? Most of the time. What about legging out? I remember everything that we say here is, is you know, it's just general guidelines and guidance, right? Trade how you want. If a strategy works out for you in a specific way, work it, you know, like use it. Uh, that's fine. So legging out of a trade. Uh, my general feeling on this is pretty much the same as legging in. Generally, it's going to be a no for me, right? Mm -hmm. So legging out of a trade, however, it does make sense if you need to exit out of a complex strategy quickly. So uh, you do this when you by separating out your trade into logical components. And best practice is to exit out the risk side of your play first, then lay out the less risky side. So uh, just, just some examples. And I think I'm going to plug those into the calculator as well, or the um, option strat calculator, just so you can see a little bit more visually on that. Uh, but let me go through this first. OK, um, we're going to go over a calendar ER spread on that and then another example here is uh i'm just showing you in text format is if you sold a wide iron butterfly for earnings for example right and a stock opened up unchanged so in a wide iron butterfly you're just betting it's a neutral strategy okay so the stock opened up in unchanged after earnings that's great you're making money right you're collecting credit so uh you want to buy back in that case if you're looking out the short strata component of the trade first to get filled faster. And that's because 
after ERs, price action is usually pretty wide. Like I mentioned this earlier today when we talk, went over our, uh, what was the play? BLNK, right? Our BLNK ER spread. So BLNK, I think, was had, a, had a, like a probably a $5 range, okay? And it was a, it's a 30 something dollar stock. So $5 range is pretty big on a $5 stock. Or even if you look at Baidu, if for some reason you, you did this kind of play on Baidu, right? Uh, so if the stock opens up unchanged in the morning, you're going to want to take profits right away. Most of the time, instead of giving it the play time and maybe it, it plays out that $5 range and it goes up a lot or it goes down a lot, right? So in order to help us to close the play really quickly, sometimes you might just want to buy back the short straddle component of the iron butterfly trade and so you can get filled faster. Because if you try to close out the whole entire trade and it has, say, four legs in it, right, which is, you know, a butterfly, iron, uh, sorry, an iron butterfly has four legs. So once you get into those more complex strategies with lots of legs, it gets really, really hard to, to fill them really quickly. So you just want to exit out the short straddle component and then you keep your um, your wings, okay? And and the reason is because the short straddle component is a side that has risk of uh, it has more value to it, right? That's that's what's going to be change the changing component more. The the wings part of the butterfly is uh, they're just long longs, okay? But they're further out of the money, and chances are. You're just gonna let them expire worthless, okay? So they're probably worth like you know a couple bucks or something. So then in this case, you would close back the short straddle component to lock in those gains real quickly at the open, and then you would just ignore your your wings, which are worth not that much anyways, and uh, you can try to close them out to collect you know a few dollars or whatever, right? But chances are you don't have to worry about it as much if you can't get filled on it right away. So that's when you would, if you actually want to leg out and you need to leg out really quickly on something, that's the only time I would recommend legging out. Otherwise, try to close out your play all at once because you don't want one part of your play, you don't want to leg out one part of your play and then have the stock price change significantly on you while you're trying to close, close it out and then you try to close out the other side of the play and the value of that changes, right? So for example, if I closed out the, um, you know, if I sold my wings, which are like worth like, you know, a couple dollars or something. Like, sure, I get my couple of dollars back, but now I have this short straddle component. And let's just say that it shoots up two or three dollars or two or three percent or whatever. And now it's out of the range of, you know, what I wanted to, to do and um, the short straddle. Because with a straddle, you want to, uh, you want to see the price change a lot, right? On a short straddle, it's a reverse, right? You, you want it to stay within that price range. So, you know, in that case or event, then you would you would get you shoot yourself in the foot. Whereas if you had kept the wings, then if it had moved a lot further out of your expectations while you're trying to close it out as a whole play, your wings would protect you because suddenly your wings would get value, right? Because you are long on those really far out of the money options. So, uh, you know, ho hopefully that makes sense to you guys. I know this might be a little bit difficult to understand without visual visuals. Uh, so let's just go into the actual option strike calculator and, and maybe that'll be a little bit more helpful. Um, okay. Option strike calculator. Pulling that up now. So let's say that, uh, and that's why I had this AMC Iron Butterfly up actually, just to explain that. All right. So in the Iron Butterfly, uh, it's a neutral strategy again, okay? So you want it to cl close between the range that you have predefined using your strikes. So in this case, I am long on the eight puts. So I bought these puts, eight dollar puts, and I bought these ten or sorry, not ten, twelve dollars calls. And you always want to make sure that the width between your middle strike and your uh, your wings, your AP and your twelve C is the same. So ten is perfect because it's two dollars, right? So always pick something right in between. I know sometimes there's like some options with like. 12.5 or something like that. In that case, make sure you pick some options where you can get you can get the um, equal width between them for the strategy. Uh, but in this case, so we bought the APs and we bought the 12 Cs, and then we sell the 10 C and we sell the 10 P. Okay, so that's this is a net credit play, and we want it to stay between 
uh, preferably between you know 850 and 1140, which is our break-even points based on our our net credit. Uh, preferably, you want it to close exactly at $10. That's where you make the most money. Okay, so you can see that here. Uh, $10 isn't on this table, but you can mess with the chart range. So I'll pull up $10, right? So we see $10 here and max profit right here, $142 at expiration. Okay, so that's what we're looking for. That's what we want on this trade. Uh, and, and say that, you know, this isn't, obviously, this isn't an ER play, right? But, you know, say that we're taking April 1st instead or something. And it was an ER play, meaning that we were just trying to crush the IV again and all of that. So you would see, usually you would see bigger um, gains on this kind of play because it would be, you know, uh, you have the ER catalyst event, right? So uh, let's see here. And you're just trying to crush these options, right? So say that it opened at $10 and say that it was, you know, Friday, right? So if it opened at $10 exactly, that's when you would want to exit your trade because you make your most money. Uh, if you wait until the end of the day, you have a chance to make a little bit more, but you don't want to risk AMC, for example, suddenly shooting up to $12 or something where you end up being red on the trade. So when you have four trades, again, as I mentioned earlier, it might be really hard to fill that quickly. And maybe AMC is going to be a quick mover in the morning uh, you know, I'm sure you've seen it before where stocks just suddenly shoot up or shoot down after open it happens all the time. Uh, so you just want to close out this trade really, really quickly. So what you would do is you would buy back the 10C and the 10P for their relative respective prices. And then you would keep these, um, 8Ps and 12Cs and, and these 8Ps and 12Cs, as you can see, they're worth 12 and 34 cents right now. Uh, if, if this was on Friday, like fast forward into the future, uh, these would be worth a less, right? Because because the premium uh, premium burn, right? Um, and data. But then you're trying to sell, so we try and buy back these uh, the short straddle. So you know this is a straddle where you buy the same or not sorry not buy, you sell the same strike for both calls and puts. You're basically betting that the market is going to move big. But in this case, we're doing the opposite. Or I, I might have flipped that around when I said it, but this is a short straddle, so we're selling these. Uh, no, normally, for a regular straddle, you would buy them, right? You would buy a 10C and a buy a 10P. And then one side would pay out big, and the other side would lose out big. That's what you're hoping for. So in a short straddle, where you're doing the reverse, by selling them, you just want it to stay flat. So uh, you would buy back this 10C and 10P first, because this is the part that is most volatile and has the most money attached to it. Whereas this is less risky, because you're long on these, but they're not worth that much already. And then you can just sell them for whatever they're worth left at the very, um, you know, before the end of the day. So that's what I mean by, you know, selling the riskier side first. And usually your riskier side is going to be your short, your shorts um, on these kinds of advanced strategies. Because uh, that's, that's what, you know, you can get assigned on them, whatever, uh, et cetera. Hopefully that made some sense. <laughs> Um, but yeah, yeah, I'm going to check with the chat now for on any questions you guys have, but you guys got any questions, I'll follow up with you guys. Oh gosh, <laughs> some terrible jokes here. Must have pulled that sense jokes from the dad a base. That's a good one. <laughs> um, yep. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Spindle Blood and uh, Roy's Dad for answering a bunch of questions. Uh, yeah, a lot of these strategies are really hard to understand. But you know, the purpose of these seminars is that eventually I'm going to be going through all of these strategies, advanced strategies, one at a time, and then we'll talk about those actually more in depth and how to use them, things like that, as we go. Right. But today is a a different type of uh, seminar. Okay. Uh, so again, avoiding PDT. So we do have this PDF available in on our X Trades Discord channel, in the education uh, channel. Sorry, our, our Discord server, in the educational channel. Um, and, you know, it's kind of, I kind of really went over it of how to do it with 
basically you're legging in into spreads, right? You can use that in order to get around PDT, to get around using day trades, right? Um, let's just take a look at that real quick, actually. And there's also some other ways you can avoid PDT, and you're probably, you know, depending on your, your uh, experience with trading, how often you trade, you're probably already familiar with this. So this is my the PDF that's posted on uh, our Xtrades Discord server. Uh, go go check that out if you guys um, you know want to, <laughs> I guess, socialize with us and uh, get bounce ideas and stuff and and to just basically learn more because we have a lot of good information in that educational channel as well. Uh, lots of videos and things by our analysts. Uh, but this one in particular is on how to lock profits without a day trade, and it's mostly about PDT, right? I published this in September 3rd, um, so actually about half a year ago now. Um, but, you know, one of the biggest obstacles is how to get around PDT, right? That's why I hear a lot. These are definitions. We kind of went over them earlier, so I'm not going to go over them again. Um, but here are the methods you can use to get around day trading locations, right? So one is you fund your account with over 25000 so if you have a margin account and you have over $25,000 in your account, you don't have to worry about day trade, but you do have to worry about maintaining a balance over 25K. If you fall underneath that, then you will fall under pay pattern uh, PDT rules again, or day trading rules. Uh, the other option is to have multiple accounts. So day trades are tracked individually by each broker for each account. So if you have multiple accounts, then that means you can have multiple day trades in every rolling five day trading period, right? For example, for myself, I have a Weibo account, I have a Robinhood account, I have a Tastyworks account, I have a Think or Swim account, and uh, I also have E-Trades, right? So, you know, each one of those brokers tracks your day trades separately. So if you are under 25K for those, you can use that in order to have more day trades. Um, you know, I, I personally don't have that many accounts for that purpose. I have that many accounts because I am splitting them up by strategy. I use different strategies on each account, and that's how I can keep track of if a strategy is successful or not, right? I want to play a different way with a different account in order to see and assess if that strategy is working out for me. Um, that's why I do it. But, you know, if, if you do day trade a lot and you need more day trades, that's another method, right? And then you can have a cash account. On Robinhood, you have to specifically request to get a cash account because they open you up as a margin account automatically. Um, Webull... You can also open up a cash account with them. And with a cash account, it just means that you can, uh, you're trading up to the balance of your account daily. The downside of a cash account is that you are unable to use margin, meaning that a lot of times you cannot uh, say, for example, like, uh, see, for example, like when you're trying to uh, sell options or something like that, you, you need to have a certain amount of collateral, but actually I don't think that applies either. I can't think of a good example right now. I'm blanking out. But uh, basically, there are some advantages and disadvantages to a cash account. But with a cash account, you can trade up to the balance of your account daily. Um, so if you have $5,000, that means every single day you can cycle through $5,000. Exactly, right? Uh, if it hasn't arrived back in your account yet, then you cannot use it. Uh, but that way, you don't actually have to worry about day trades because there's no limitations in how many day trades you can do. You're just limited by the amount of cash you have. And then options. So we already talked about that, where we leg into spreads, and that's how you can um, get around day trading uh, restrictions with options. So in that case, you're opening another option position against your current position. And you know, I, I talk about examples and how to do it uh, throughout the rest of this document. I'm not going to go over it because we already talked about it. Uh, but if you if you need to learn how to do it in Robinhood and how to open spreads and stuff and where all the buttons are, stuff like that, this PDF has it all. So I recommend you to take a look at it if you are interested uh, in that and, and, you know, if you need further reference to it. But, you know, we kind of went over that today already. Um, but if you need a visual guide on how to do that in Robinhood specifically beyond just the theoreticals, then uh, this guide will show you how, how to do it all. Okay. So, yep. All right, that's it for her PDT uh, and how to, how to get around it. So now, you know, we, we've been going on for about an hour and a half already. This is kind of where I plan to end. Um, but, you know, I'm open to doing some Q&A, maybe up to 
for another 12, 12, 15 minutes or so. If you guys have any questions, uh, you guys want any chart reviews or requests, or if you want to see if there's something good place, um, type in the chat and we will check them out. Thanks, 007. We will see you next time. And I'll, oh, also, uh, if you guys don't normally come and join us, come and check out 007 After Hours every single day. As he sees here, Monday through Friday, uh, reviewing ERs and doing chart reviews and requests. So definitely come check him out uh, on Monday through Fridays. Yeah, uh, Roy's dead. I actually also did a butterfly on GameStop yesterday. Uh, I had I opened it on Thursday, and um, what did I do again? I I think I sold the one ninety C. I bought the one seventy five, and uh, and I bought the two hundred five. Yep. So I sold two of the one nineties, right? Per butterfly. But yeah, that that turned out really profitable because um. GME did hit that middle spot quite a few times throughout the day, so it, it was really good. Uh, thanks. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm going to try to get those up to YouTube. But you know what? Uh, if anybody is good at, at editing, video editing, uh, hit me up on on Discord, like DM me or whatever, because I I've just been really busy. I haven't had time to like edit these videos, um, and, and they are pretty long. Like they, I think the first one was like three hours, and then I got better at it, and it was two hours. The next time, and now we're doing about an hour and a half to two hours, which is about where I think is the max I really want to do, uh, in one session sitting, right? Um, but yeah, if anyone's good at you know editing and stuff, hit me up on Discord. Uh, and then, you know, it's long, takes a long time to edit probably, but at the same time you can watch it and you can learn all the stuff, um, that's in those videos. Uh, Iron Condor and Butterfly Plays. Yeah, I, I don't think I'm going to really alert any of those because when they have so many layers, it just gets really, really complicated to alert. And in fact, our bot doesn't even track it. So every single time I post an ER calendar play, that doesn't actually go into any of my stats on X traits. Like, it, it doesn't accept the play because it's like, it doesn't know what it is. It can only accept, our bots can only accept um, naked uh, calls or puts, right? Like, you can sell the open or you can buy the open, but you can't, you can't do multiple at the same time. And then if I open them separately at the same time, right, like looking in, then people will get confused on it. Or also, uh, you know, the, the bot, the tracking system for X trade is going to report, like, most of those legs as losses, right? Because you're profiting on on the on the trade as a whole, but some of those legs are going to be losers, right? So uh, that's another reason why I'm a little bit averse to to alerting them. But mostly it's just because it's really complicated. People don't really aren't really that familiar with it. Usually, if I do alert a spread, I'm, it's only going to be a two leg spread. So it's just going to be calendar spreads, vertical spreads. I might alert like some more advanced strategies and watch lists or something. And if you guys want to follow those, you can follow those as well. Uh, but I know Roy's that also alerts a lot of those things or mentions a lot of those things in option swings. Excuse me. Uh, but yeah, check that out. Check the option swing section. That's where you'll find more of the advanced um, option spreads and talk usually. Uh, usually the main chat is a little bit more cluttered with um, scalps and things like that. So, uh, And usually for scalps and stuff, you just want to get in a uh, naked play because you're just trying to capture momentum. So spreads are more advantageous when you are not necessarily trying to capture momentum, but you're trying to get a more risk-defined trade and swing trading as where um, spreads come into a bigger advantage. Uh, if you're new to option bigs, B-I-G-Z-3611. If you're new to options, come check out our Discord channel uh, and check out our education section. There's a lot of good videos there and uh, a lot of good tips. Um, yeah. Yep, Wheel Strategy is great. Peace Music, I do a lot of those too. 
Uh, Condor is indeed flat. Yes, it is a neutral strategy. Oh. Yeah, uh... Peace Musics, um... What's your what's your username on uh, Discord? Is it the same thing? Ah, wash sale disallowance. Good point. Kindle blood. That's another whole topic altogether. <laughs> another clarification on calendar spreads. Uh I guess, I guess, um, what's your question about it? Same name. Perfect. All right. We'll do that. Okay. Uh, I know somebody mentioned, uh, VIAC, right? Earlier. Who was that? I think I saw it somewhere in the chat. Let's take a look at that ticker. And if you guys have any other tickers you want me to review or uh, anything you want me to look at, just put it into the chat and then we'll take a look at it. Okay. Uh, v I A C. And, uh, um, on calendar spreads, uh, maybe I'll I'll do a quick review on how I find it uh, right after I look at VIAC. So stick around for um, how I look for calendar spreads and how how to execute them. Uh, I'll, I'll go over a little bit more in detail again uh, after looking at VIAC. Stick around for that. Okay, VIAC. So, geez, I think I looked at this. Uh, yesterday or the day before or something like that and <laughs> it looks so ugly uh i don't really know what to think about this but just looking at it from from this nothing about fundamentals or whatever right just just looking at the chart what's going on right here we we gapped down huge okay we we touched the 50 daily sma this is the the blue line is the 50 daily sma and we just kind of plunge right through it. And then yesterday we hit the 200 daily SMA and we bounced off of it, right? Actually, we didn't quite hit the 200 daily SMA, but we got real close. And in fact, a lot of stocks did this yesterday. Like Baidu, you saw the same thing. It it like almost touched the 200 daily SMA and it kind of bounced off of that. So, I mean, honestly, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't trade this. Uh, it's too volatile to trade right now. Uh, that's just me personally. I, I don't see the risk and reward. I don't think it's worth it to trade. Uh, but let's just take a look at where possible support areas are and stuff. And wow, I can really feel my computer or my ultrabook essentially lagging a lot right now when I'm trying to chart. Um, it's really bad. So I always try to find support and resistance, right? Find the trend line. Where is the trend line? Okay. So old trend line, right? It was it was bouncing off of this before and then it went started going parabolic. Once you start seeing this happen, when a stock starts lifting off the trend line like this and it never comes back and it just keeps going up like this, it's essentially going parabolic. And when a stock goes parabolic, you don't know where it's gonna end, but eventually it's gonna come back down. It has to correct. Stocks go parabolic but they need to correct like example of that tesla right it, it did the same thing uh, let me just pull that up real quick you're probably already familiar with the tesla chart i'm sure most of you have probably looked at tesla trade tesla but if you look at the daily chart here uh let me turn on auto that's screwing up with my thing um you know it, it basically went parabolic right it started lifting up off this trend line and it never came back to this trend line and then it had formed a new trend line and then it went off of that and, and it literally just went parabolic. So if you look at like a, a weekly chart or something, you will see how parabolic it Tesla is. Like, you know, this 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 kind of price action is 
is amazing. You don't know when it's going to end. Like, it did this for a whole year and a half, I think. Right? And this motion. You don't know when it's going to end, but when it does, there's going to be a big correction. Uh, stocks can't go parabolic forever. Uh, it just doesn't work that way. And, and we, we see that. So we got, we got this major dip right here of, um, I think it's what, 30, 40%, whatever. Uh, but anyways, going back to VIAC. Okay. So we see the same thing happening here with VIAC, but this is really parabolic, right? Like it just, it just left it off and never came back. So usually we like to see stocks retest their moving averages at some point. So this, this is the 50 MA and the day, uh, 200 daily SMA. So we like to see them touch back base because it gives us better confidence for it to move up from there. But when it never comes back down like this, that's, you know, you can trade it for sure and, and definitely trade it. But uh, right now it, it needed this correction. And, uh, you know, it's just, I just think it's too volatile. Right, personally, I think if you really wanted to though, this right here, your daily SMA was probably a good spot to try to add in uh, or to go long. Um, and this is just based on a technical basis, right? Right. So we, I see some support here, right? This is this is where I would want to enter, right here in this rank. So about thirty seven dollars or so, thirty seven to. Uh, $38 is where I would want to enter. But of course, now you just see this and I printed a, um, I, I wouldn't call this a spinning top, but it's because it's so, so wide. But basically, it, it closed the day flat. I think by day, you see the same thing happening. But I would look for, you know, we, we want to trade off but support or resistance, right? Uh, so that's what we're going to be looking for here. If it holds above this, Support here about forty seven dollars forty six eighty six is where I drew this support right, and we also have this. Let me draw another line here. So this is what I would call the zone. So we have this support here because we have multiple. Uh, sorry, not there. So on the bottom. There we go. So we have multiple touches here. Um, and so I find that this was it was good support before. So this is where I'll be looking for this range right here, right in between forty six eighty to forty eight twenty. If VIAC can hold this area and it bounces up from here, then that's where I would go long. Um, and my long target, I mean, there's this huge gap though, right? We would think that eventually it would fill this gap, but honestly, I would not trade it right now. Give it another couple of days to see if it finds support. Because when it when stocks move like this, it's really low volatile still. It can bounce up and then it can go back down, right? Um, that would not be unusual. So personally, I would not trade this right now. I would wait at least another few days to see if it finds support. This is probably going to be my next price target right here, sixty dollars. If it can hold this area. Ideally, what I would want to see is I would want to see it retest this 200 daily SMA and bounce off of it. And that's where I would enter and I would go long up to here. Uh, and of course, we have this gap fill, right, from 67 ish to $90. And we would look for that to fill eventually. But, uh, you know, I'm not really too optimistic right now. I, I, I think there's a lot of stocks that were really hyped up and they went really parabolic and they just, they just don't really, they're not really supposed to be that high. Uh, but, you know, the markets trade the way they want. <laughs> what I think is valuable or not valuable doesn't really matter uh, sometimes, but we just play play what we see. So, but anyways, I'd look for support there or for it to form a base over here around $46, $47. Uh, BTO is buy to open, STO is sell to open, BTC is Bitcoin, uh, but it's actually buy to close. STC is sell to close. So, you know, when we're closing out a trade, we use the C's, and when we're opening a trade, we use the O's. So buy to open means that we're long on a position, and sell to open means we're short on a position.
oversold you guys think it's oversold i mean yeah i mean it's definitely oversold if you look at rsi over here on uh, viac you can see it hits it's hit uh it's hit the bottom right like maybe it goes down really low like over here back in march 2020 yeah. right but you know it's it's oversold but i wouldn't rely on on like i use indicators but i don't use them to trade i always trade off of the price action and I use the indicators just to confirm for myself to give me more confidence or confirmation in my trades. Um, but yeah, I mean, like if, if you feel really risky, you want to take some risk on, then you can you can definitely trade VIAC bullish to the upside, right? Because it's it's dropped so much. But preferably, I would look for I would wait a couple of days and see if it forms a support under here the 200 daily SMA or over here around 47 to 48 where it closed today. So if we can maintain this area. Then I would trade up to here to, to 60 as my first price target. A, a lot of things had really big drops this past week. Like TME, Baidu, uh, et cetera. Okay. Um, so calendar spreads, right? Uh let's let's just go over how how to find how I find a ER calendar spread play, okay? Because I think that's what some of you guys are interested in and want to hear more about, right? And if you guys have any other questions, let me know. So what the first thing I usually do is I just pull up a our ER calendar uh, chart, not chart, infographic, whatever you call these. Uh, so e Earnings Whisper, you know, they, they're a website that um, focuses primarily on ERs and they tell you what their expectations are, what the analyst expectations are, things like that. So it, it's pretty useful, right? Um, I use them to give me a heads up on like the big companies that are reporting that week because that's what we want to know. Uh, there are other ways to find ERs too, and there's more ERs than just this, but these are the ones that are usually more of interest. Hey, look. Is this X-Trade? I didn't know we were public. <laughs> okay, so I'm kind of interested in what this is. Does anybody know what this is? I feel like I should look it up. It doesn't show up. <laughs> what is this? Is it Trade X? <laughs> it's probably Trade X, right? I don't know. Is that what this is? Let me see if I can if it pulls up. Nope. Okay. Does anybody know what that ticker is? Because I don't know. Okay. Anyways, um, so usually I, I look at at this earnings whisper report. So I go to Twitter and I pull pull it up, and then I see. First of all, I always look for names I'm already familiar with, because if I know about it, then that means that it's likely I've traded it before, and that means it has you know good options or something, or it has good volume, um, uh, something of interest. So right off the top of the bat, I mean, I specialize in certain tickers, so obviously I don't know all of them. But, you know, BlackBerry, right? Not really my favorite ticker to trade. But, you know, it, it's been of interest because of uh, because of short interest, right? Uh, and, and all the uh, Wall Street bets craze, all of that, GME, AMC, et cetera. BlackBerry showed up on that, and so that's why it's, you know, maybe we can take a look at that. Uh, we have Chewy here. That's one of my favorite stocks to play. So I'm I'm already in a trade, but we can take a look at that for a possible ER calendar spread play too. And then we have Lululemon, right? So that's probably also another big one. Um, let's see. I think Arcadia is energy, right? Um, so that might be interesting to take a look at too. Uh, usually, even if I'm not familiar with the name, I will just go through and run all of these too to see what's going on. Uh, but we're going to look at these first. Blackberry, Chewy... Uh, Arcadia. And then on Thursday, the first one that stands out to me is Micron. So that's MU. Uh, you got your semiconductors, right? Dave and Busters. Uh, I'm not really sure. I've never traded Dave and Busters. Uh, CarMax, also kind of interesting. But okay. So we're just going to start with Tuesday first. Um, or maybe I'll start with Monday, but I'm not really familiar with these. There's a lot of bio companies. Oh, I think. Okay. Let's look that up. So after I decide, you know, what, what stocks I'm going to look it up, I just type them in here. I use option strat. So we got um, 
Denimer Scientific, DNMR, and it has its uh, earnings on Monday after hours. So I don't want to do an iron butterfly. I want to do a calendar spread. So we're going to pull up calendar call spread. You can do a call spread or a put spread uh, for the purposes of an ER calendar play. It doesn't really make much of a difference, but if you do have some directional bias, then that's what you would pick. And also, if you want to hold it out longer term, then that's what you would do. So you can see here that DNMR only has monthly contracts, okay? And unfortunately for us, the monthly contract for March is already passed because that was March uh, 19th. Yeah. Yep, March 19th. So it's already passed. So I will not be taking, I will not be using the strategy for uh, DNMR because it's too far out. April 16th is too far out to have much of an IV effect uh on on the options contract so you can look here if you click on on these flags of the option contract you can see what the iv is right uh you can also find this on your on any broker uh when you open a trade or whatever you can just click on it and look at the the greeks right but uh, i use option strat to to plan out everything uh it's just easier for me so you can see that the iv is 81 percent on may and then on the front dated it is higher there's only 87%. There's only a 6% skew, which is which is nothing. Uh, basically non-existent. And that makes sense. Like, ER is, you know, next week on, on the 29th, and, and you're, this contract April 16th is like two or three weeks out. Like, it's, it's basically not going to have that much impact. And I think originally the stock itself might not, it might not be a high IV stock in the first place, right? So uh, we're not going to look at that because they don't have contracts expiring the week of um, earnings report. And that's what we're looking for, because we want to crush that front option that's expiring after uh, earnings report. So I'm just going to like type all of these, right? Let's look at BioSec, right? BioC, because I think some people are trading this, but this is the same thing, OK? So um, I think I'm just going to ignore all of these for now. Maybe I usually will look over them too, just to check. Uh, but let's just focus our efforts right now on stocks that I know are probably going to be more likely to have a good play. So let's look at BlackBerry first. So let's skip all of Monday because I'm not really familiar with those stocks. So BlackBerry has weekly options, right? Remember those criteria I mentioned before? Um, you know, we want an IV skew over 100%. We want... Uh, we want options that have weekly options, and we, we want to make sure that, you know, it has decent market cap size. BlackBerry is a big company, right? And and has a lot of interest in it. Okay, so those are some of the more important ones that I look at, right? So we're going to take April 1st, and then we're going to sell April 9th. You can also alternatively do 16th or longer if you want, but usually for the purpose of my ER calendar spread place, I'm just trying to capture an immediate profit and not try to hold it long term. And so that's why I usually just do one week. Maybe you can do the month the next monthly call out too if you want. Uh, and it's usually less risky that way. But I usually find that I have the greatest profits and probability of success when I just do one week out. Um, it is safer to go longer. Uh, but for me, the profitability to probability ratio is pretty good with weeklies. And that's why I do that. Okay. Um, so it's up to your risk tolerance. That's what I'm saying. So BlackBerry is $9.63. So we always want to wait for the end of the day, and we try to see, uh, get a strike that's close to where the current price is, right? Because we're trying to be neutral. We want it to be flat. So you see here that if we take the 10C, 1 and the 9, it only costs $17 for a play. So that's our max loss, $17. But our max profit here is reported to be $55. So that's, that's great, right? But here's the thing. IV is going to drop after earnings report. IV always drops after an earnings report. But the reason why uh, I still like these plays is because the front option has more IV to drop than the back option. Of course, you also have to pay attention to Vega. And Vega is um, the change in the premium price of the contracts as uh, in correlation with IV. So you multiply IV by the, the Vega in order to get the... Uh, premium contract pricing, along with the other uh, Greeks, right? So usually Vega is going to be higher on your further dated option than your front dated option. 
And so this is why, like, when the IV spread is not that big, I still don't like to take it like that because even though the front data option will get crushed, IV crushed more because the Vega is higher, right, on um, the backdated option, uh, then it kind of balances out. But when the IV skew is really, really high, then that's when we can take better advantage of it. Um, but anyways, uh, with IV, we expect it to crush. So there's a slider here. So it's just 140%. So, you know, you can slide it down. Say like, oh, it goes down to 97%. Then you see that your profit margin starts shrinking a lot, right? So that's why I don't rely on this. You know, it's not, it's not necessarily a true number because, because after earnings, this will change so much that it's really hard to predict exactly where will happen. Um, but yeah, that's what I'm looking for here is is the IV skew in order to make it more profitable more probable to be profitable for us right so we see here that the IV skew is only 30 percent and another thing to know about IV skew is that it increases the skew usually increases as you get closer to earnings which is another reason why I usually open up right before uh, the day of earnings and um, th this, you can also play this in another way because IV ramps up into earnings re uh, reports. You can buy contracts, you know, one or two weeks before ER, and then you know, you know, because of IV increasing, your contracts will be worth more. So um, that can also be played that way. Okay. So here, I'm not gonna look, take BB because the skew is too low for me. It's only thirty percent. So let's move on to the next one. Maybe look look at uh, I don't know Lulu. And so this is what I basically do every single week. I go through every single um, ER and I look at what's going on with with these numbers. The first thing I look at is IV skew. Do they have weekly contracts? And then I just keep filtering at them. And then once I find some with high IV skew, then I go to the chart and I figure out is it worth it to play it right. So here, 58% versus 78%. Again, not a very high skew. Uh, so not something I like. But let's just say, for example, right? For example, if this skew was higher, say, say it was um, the skew was 100%, so the difference between the IVs was 100%, then uh, these numbers would probably be different, right? And we already know IV is going to drop so I'm just going to say it drops like half or something, right? So then it's saying that my break even points are 300 and 322. Uh, again, this isn't really that accurate. But so if you have these three tens, that means you have about $10, 10 to $12 leeway on both sides after accounting for some IV drop, right? So let's just pull up Lulu to see how I would trade this or if I would trade this. So if you go to Lulu here, Oh, Lulu, Lulu, Lulu. Interesting. So uh, I don't have any information on this chart, right? I don't have any lines, support and resistance, no trend lines, nothing. I just have MA. Let me hide my indicators because those are annoying. Uh, so I'm going to try to find out you know, what the price action on Lulu is to try to see what the range is, right? So uh, I see that there's a descending trend line here. I see that it's been following this descending trend line down. So, ooh, I, I, feel, I feel a little bit shaky here, but this is the whole market right now. The whole market kind of looks like this, where it bounces up into the trend line, rejects, bounces up into the trend line, rejects, right? It's been doing that for most, uh, a lot of tickers in the market. Um, not all tickers. We still have some tickers that are performing really well, Examples of that would be like energy tickers right now, oil, uh, real estate is doing decent, uh, industrial, like, you know, a lot of people have just been focusing a lot on big tech tickers, and that's why we're, we're in a lot of pain right now, right? Uh, this past week for a lot of people, because we're just used to training tech tickers. So you look at, um, I know I'm getting sidetracked here, but if you look at this, this is a NASDAQ chart, right? And then we compare it with SPY chart, right? We're almost at all-time high on SPY. Tech, Nasdaq, not even close. It looks it looks way more bearish compared to SPY. So uh, make sure to pay attention to other sectors other than tech. Okay.
Um, getting off my soapbox on that. <laughs> if you read my weekend reports, you probably hear that all the time. Oh, and be sure, guys, to vote on the weekend report uh, analysis ticker form. Uh, I will be going over chart reviews and tickers on that as well. Uh, yeah, in case we don't have time to go over more specific ones today. But vote on that. Um, and I'll push out that report on Sunday. I usually give a broad market overview as well, including sectors I think are good to look at. Okay, back to Lulu here. So let's just uh, identify support and resistance, right? That's what we're doing. So support and resistance, always find uh, your, your peaks. Um, any of your pivot points, so this is a pivot point here. And if there are multiple touches to that area, then it's, it's even better, right? Uh, and I usually pick like, you know, all time high as well, because that's, that's important. We look for that to break. So, you know, all time high is there. I wouldn't look for that first though. I would look for this first, because it's uh, closer. So I think I have enough here, but I think it's probably one more. I can draw one more line over here. Right here. Okay. So see that it, it wicked below the support before, but then it bounced up off of that. And you can see there's a small wick over here too, but it bounced off of that. And then it did the same thing over here, but this time it, it actually had a, the, the body of the candle was actually below the support, but it did end up bouncing up off of it, right? So right now, I don't know, Lulu looks a little bit bearish because of this setup right here, right? We have this, um, Descending trend line here. I'm trying to see if there's anything else I see. Is there a... No. Yeah. All right. Anyways, I'd be worried about this acting as resistance here, and then we drop back down to here, right? I think I think this is a solid support area right here. It's 260. This is the pre-COVID high. A lot of stocks have been looking for this to return back to pre-COVID levels, either from the downside or from the upside if they went up too far. So that's that's an excellent area to look for support and it kind of bounce off that area here you can see that um but yeah these are my support and resistance lines for now uh, you can also use fibs but let's not don't want to get too much into that right now so we're just looking at this from the er perspective right so uh er is next tuesday for um lulu lulu lemon uh their estimate is two dollars and 49 cents so let's just take a look at what it did on previous ERs, right? So we see here in the previous ERs, it surprised. Uh, the estimate was 88 cents, and they surprised. But look what happened with that ER. Basically, after ER, it it it, it just dropped, right? It dumped. So uh, <laughs> this happens a lot, and this is why I prefer to trade using a more neutral strategies on ER reports. And you can see here the next. One also had a major drop. Okay. And then over here, we go back one more. Also, another drop. So, um, seems like the, for the past three ERs, Lily Lemon likes to drop a lot. So, we see here uh, a little bit more mixed here. So, the 26th of February, um, basically it dropped and it kept one back up. But, you know, that's more neutral, but I would still say it dropped overall. So it looks like Lululemon likes to dump after earnings. <laughs> All right. So we can see here that it actually rose on this one. Uh, and let's get the moves on this. So this is 171 and it moved up to 183. So that's about a $12 move, right? Over here, we got a 235 to 218. So that's about a $17 move. Um, let's look at some of the more recent ones. But these ones over here, like I think, Lululemon dumped a lot. Like, what's this? 366 down to 346. So that's like a $20 move. So if we look back at our calendar cost spread, we have about a $12 leeway. So if, you know, if Lululemon moves like it did back here, then we can safely say, you know, or like assume that Chances are we can be at least break even or green. But if it does something like this, we are going to lose a bit. Uh, so it's risky. So 
Not really a big fan. Uh, but another thing is, I mean, in the first place, the IV skew isn't good, right? 78% versus 58%. That's only a 20% skew. It doesn't give us much extra premium to burn uh, on that front date option in order to, to give us a better, um, higher probable trade. That's what I'm looking at here on how I evaluate the ERs. Uh, the second thing I do is after I look at these previous earnings reports and like maybe you know something about the company, maybe you're familiar with the fundamentals and you, you think that it's going to perform a certain way, you can use that as your bias. Uh, I mostly just look at technical though. Um, but I'm, I might choose like, you know, a call or a put based on something I know about the company, but I would still choose something that's close to the current price. So I know that support, my, I have a support here at 288. And then my resistance is over here at 324, or maybe it's this trend line here, so it'd be 317. So considering that, um, putting that into my expectations, I would want my range to cover this, right? I would want it to cover at least from 288 to 317 or so. So if we look back over here, we're not quite, quite covering that. So maybe I can move my spread down, right? At this point, you would take a put because it's below the price. Oh, actually, the three tenths was already below the price. Um, but always, always do out of the money. And so the way you would do that is if it's below the price, you have to do puts. And if it's above the price, then you do calls. Uh, I think that's pretty straightforward because you're, you're directional, um, slight directional. But yeah, I would want it to cover this range. And that's what I look for because, you know, I, there's always a chance it drops below this and there's always a chance it breaks above, but it's more likely to stay here. And that's, that's the idea or the logic behind the play that I'm taking. And um, you never know what's going to happen with ER, and that's why these are risky. But, you know, I find, again, you probably sound like a broke, I probably sound like a broken record right now, but, you know, I have about an 80% success rate with these plays. So that's that's how I, um, I do it. Uh, but anyways, I don't like it. I don't like the idea for an ER calendar play on Lulu. Um, the range is just too wide on some of these drops. Like these moves are the most recent ERs have have wide moves. Like this is huge. Th even this is still like 20 something dollars. It's just more than what I think our spread can handle. And so I wouldn't do that. Um, alternatively, if you want to increase your, your, a similar concept, uh, play the ERs and you want it to be neutral on it. You can also do things like iron condors, right? You can also do uh double diagonals right or you can even do a double calendar um you know this it's all just up to you how you want to trade it for myself i prefer doing just a single calendar call spread uh i tracked the difference between them before a few times on a few tickers that i played like the differences throughout the day and at some point of the day one of the spreads outperformed the other, and then during a different part of the day, another spread outperformed another. So it just kind of depends on the price. I like to stick with just single calendar call spreads uh, because it's easier to get into them because there are only two legs to it. And, you know, generally I find pretty good success for it as long as I properly filter for those, um, for those Greeks, right? For the IV skew, if the ticker looks good, things like that. So that's why I do that. But if less, it's less risky when you do things like uh, double diagonals, for example, or or say an iron condo. Um, and I know Roy's dad does a lot of those, and I, I have done them too in the past. Uh, usually, when I'm less certain about a stock, I might do something like that. All right. Okay. Anyways, uh, Lulu is not the best option here. So let's move on. Let's pull up Chewy, and then we can look at Arcadia. Oh, uh, keep typing the wrong thing. There we go. So, Chewy, uh, <laughs> I'm in some calls for Chewy for April 16th. And I think they're under the wire now by dollar, maybe $2 or something, which is a lot. I think it's like 30% down. Um, I'm still holding them. Uh, but yeah, I, I am holding them because I expect there to be some kind of ER run up, pre ER run up pump, something like that. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm still holding on to those in case anybody was wondering. 
but looking at Chewy here, um, you know, I'm I'm obviously bullish on it. It's kind of returned back to this old bullish channel trend that it had. It kind of went parabolic here, and then it returned back to normal, right? As I said before, whenever a stock goes parabolic, at some point it has to come back and correct. But now it's trying to find support over here in the previous bullish channel. It was running pretty much all of last year. So I'm looking for support around this area, you know, $74, $76. Um, and that's why I'm still holding long calls on it. Uh, but th they do have ERs next week. So let's look at this from the perspective of a year and calendar spread play. Should we? So pulling that up. And choose the uh, one week out options. And let's go up ADC. I think that's fine. So you see here that it gives a pretty wide range. And that's before we drop the volatility, right? So IV is only 34%. So again, not high enough. But let's just say, for example, I want to play it. Um, Usually, you'll find that the IV skew will be higher when you hit Thursday. And this is why I like Thursday to Friday plays and why in the Discord, in our alert channel for Options Alert, you almost always see me alerting these plays on Thursday because that's when the highest probability plays pop up. Um, yeah. But, you know, let's just say that I wanted to take the play regardless, right? So my expectations would be that Chewy would hold 75. Like, it's not going to go below 75. It's pretty strong support here. Like, you know, uh, this is a previous, one of the previous structures pivot high, right? And it kind of played around over here um, before it went up parabolic. And then it, it retraced back down to that level over here on the quick dump. And that's where it bounced the first time. And so now we're trying to, trying to find a base here, right? So, you know, I would expect it to hold 75. That's what I would want it to do. And then I would expect, you know, the top to be about over here, 86, or maybe over here, $88, because that's where these wicks are. So that would be my range. That's what I'm looking for. 75 to 87. So you can play like an iron condor on this. But uh, let's just say, for example, I'm, I'm just doing an ear calendar spread. Let's just say that the IV skew was good. If the IV skew isn't that good on this, you know, I would prefer to do just something like an iron condor or, or a double diagonal, sorry, use another type of strategy. This uh, single or this two leg calendar call spread for ERs, I only like to use it when there's good IV skew. If I want to play an ER and I expect it to be within a certain range, but the IV skew isn't that good, then I would instead do an iron condor. Okay. Uh, but, anyways, this just. Say that I'm doing ER Congress spread. So I would look for something like 80, $82, right? Because that's pretty much in the middle between these two areas. And if I draw, or if you just look at where my mouse is, you see that I previously peaked up over here and it kind of bounced off of that and then it rocketed up off this level, right? About 82. So that's what I, I would try to look for. So, you know, I'll do 82C because I'm actually kind of bullish on Chewy. Um, so this is when I have a bias on a stock. I would do something like that. If I was trying to be non-biased though, and I was trying to strictly play and follow those rules that I set, the guidelines on any random stock, then I would take something like 79 seats because that's the closest strike to what the current price action is at. And then if we, if we drop the volatility, I don't know, by 20, 30%, you know, we get a good range, $71, $87. And, and you know what? That's really good. It's, this is a 75 to 86, right? So, uh, you know, this, this play might be worth taking a look at when we draw up to Tuesday. And again, a reminder, these IV SKUs do improve as the week progresses. As you get closer to the... Um, the ERs, the IV skew would increase. So if we look here, 86% versus 124. So that's, uh, and I can't even do my math right now, but it's less than 40%, right? 4126, so that's 38%. Yep, 38%. Um, so it's 38% skew, which is pretty low for me. Usually if I take something earlier in the week, I want it to at least have like a 50 to 70% IV skew 
at least, at least that much. Um, and if it's towards the end of the week, that's when you can find those 100% skewed plays. Uh, but, you know, if I really want to take the play, I would wait until it, it formed at least 50 to 70%. And I usually find that it does increase by maybe another 10, 20% a day uh, moving up into ER. So we might actually hit my minimum for that on Chewy. Um, but, but anyways, so this basically falls within that range. And if you're wondering about, you know, how much to lower this IV by, uh, there's actually data out there on how these options change their IV. So you can actually get a better idea of what the IV would more likely to be, and then you can adjust this based on that, right? So on Thinkorswim, the Swim Thinkorswim platform, they actually have um, historical data on the past, you know, seven or eight ERs where you can see what happens to the IV, uh, what happens to straddle prices, things like that. And then you can use that and you can assess that uh, as well as the change after ER to decide if the play is worth taking or not, right? So, um, you know, you can find the data in other places as well. Uh, but, you know, on Thinkorswim, it's free. You know, you can download Thinkorswim for free and you can make an account for free and then you can pull up the data for free. So that's what I would encourage you to do if you are interested in uh, doing more of these kinds of strategies, right? So you can do that research. But you can see historically what the IV crush was like after ERs. And then you can plug that in and see if it works. Uh, for myself, I usually knock it down like 30 or 40%. And I consider that good enough. And if the break-even range is within uh, my expected parameters for the play, then I will take it because... Usually, you know, obviously I'm going to hope for the best, right? I'm going to hope that, you know, it just stays flat where my strike is. But, you know, I, I just, you want to give yourself some uh, idea of what will happen. Like, where would you start losing on the play? And for these kinds of plays, usually, again, I do just close them off for 30% right off the bat. And then uh, that's it. Um, but if you notice that if you just wait, you know, the profit starts increasing as you get closer to the expiration because we're just burning that front premium. But again, unless you are confident that the stock is not moving anywhere anytime soon or that it's falling, you know, within this range, I highly encourage you to just take the profits that open so you don't have to worry about the trade swinging against you. Um, all right. Uh, so I know some people are asking about IV again, probably, right? Let me check with the chat real quick to, to see if there's any, any questions. Sorry about that. I know I've just been blabbing away over here. So Pika Lulu jumps after its ER. Does that change how you play it? Yeah, so um, great question, Spindleblood. Uh, you can change it to a bearish bias. If you have a bearish bias, you can definitely take something um, like a lower strike on puts. So you can apply your bias to the calendar spread. Uh, usually what I'm expecting more is a more flat type of play. With, that's when I usually take these calendar call spreads, like I'm more neutral. But if I'm feeling a little bit more bearish, like just like my example with Chewy here, because I'm more bullish, I actually set it to like, what, 82, right? Because it's higher, and that's $4 above. But usually I try not to go too far away from, from the current price, because that's where the move is going to be based off of the current price, right? Uh, using historical data, stuff like that, to see what the percent moves are, it's going to be based on that. Oh, and um, actually, let me guys show you uh, what it looks like on Tastyworks. So you can see the the IV um, expected the expected moves, right? Uh, and this isn't a very broker to broker. We're also going to take a look at barchart.com and maybe uh, how that can help you guys with identifying these plays. Uh, let me see if I can pull up the pull up my. Um, Tasty works account first. One second, guys. Also, sorry if my voice is starting to uh, it's hard to hear or something. I'm just getting a little bit tired talking. I think. Uh, uh, I also had four hours of mentoring yesterday, and by the time I was done with that, I was. My voice was like, I felt like I was going to give out. Uh, I literally just keep talking and talking. And uh, oh, I know somebody was asking about the IV rank and stuff, right? 
So with IB rank, um, like every single stock has its own individual uh, IV, right? Like some stocks have high IV all the time. Some stocks have low IV all the time. And the way you can see if it's high or low relative to normal for that particular stock is IV rank. And you can find that information um, probably from all your brokers, but you can also find it on uh, barchart.com. Okay. Anyways, this is Tastyworks here. So uh, this is this is one of my smaller accounts that I use for um, calendar spreads. But let's take a look at it. Well, what I'm trying to look for. So we're going to pull up, say, Chewy, for example, because we want to play Chewy. And out of all the ones we looked at so far today, Chewy has the highest IV skew. So that's, you know, if I was going to pick one from the ones that we did today, that it would probably be Chewy. Uh, ideally, you know, for Tuesday ER, I'm probably going to want it to have at least 50% IV skew. Um, during later during the week on Thursday, that amount increases to 100%, and that's where I find the best quality plays usually. Uh, but, you know, general guidelines, um, if you think you have a good grasp of what the price action is going to be, then you can always take a play, right? We're just playing probabilities here. That's what we're doing. So uh, I pulled up Chewy here. Um, if you're not familiar with Tastyworks layout, these are, this is the options chains, right? And usually I'm trading on my phone. So I'm actually also not that familiar with uh, the look of this. Okay. So if you click over here on the dates for your Tasty, uh, Tasty Works, um, you can pull up all the list of uh, the, all the, the options chain, right? So let's see. This looks really, really odd to me. I don't know why there's these boxes here kind of blocking my, my uh, vision. But all right, let's just look at implied volatility because that's what we care about right now. Um, and I just noticed it doesn't tell me on the desktop version. Interesting. Okay, so anyways, uh, April 1st is 120% and April 9th is 95%. So that means the skew is... 25% about, approximately 25% uh, between these two weeks. And so with that 25%, it, it's basically an average, right, of the implied volatility of all contracts expiring that day. Some, even within the same expiration day, you're going to see a difference in IV. You can even find high IV skill within the same day sometimes. And when you see something like that, maybe it's because some smart money, big whale, or something like that is going heavy in on a specific contract. And that's what's causing the IV to be really high on a specific contract. Uh, if you've seen any of our alerts in the Discord channel or server before on Xtrades, anytime I see an alert go out for one of Guru's options alerts, I look at that IV and I see it spike. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's it's... It's, uh, it's a pretty noticeable effect when uh, we get a lot of volume on a certain contract. So that's why, you know, whenever you see those alerts, try to set those limits, right? Make sure you're entering in a limit, not just hitting the market buy, because that's just going to jack up the IV, which jacks up the premium for everybody. And then you get in higher than what you're supposed to. Um, anyways, I went off on a tangent again. But... Uh, I don't see it on here on Tastyworks on the desktop version, but when I use it on the mobile version, you'll see a plus or minus percent over here. And that gives you an idea of what, what the expected price to move is. Okay. So um, next to the IV on the mobile version, you will see a plus or minus percent over here. I wonder if... Yeah, let's, let's, just, let's just move on from that. Um... And just, let's just go to barchart.com. So barchart.com. So when you go to barchart.com, um, 
you can find you know information about stocks or options futures or forex as well i'm going to focus on options here so if if you want to look for iv rank and i am lagging a lot on my computer so this is taking a very long time to do okay joey Maybe I need to close some some windows or something. Yep, the, the website I was previously using is Option Strat. And uh, yes, um, when you have increased interest in the contract, then the IV will go up. So I, IV is implied volatility, you know, it's what the market is expecting something to, to happen on, on the options contract. When you have high volume on a contract, it means a lot of people are interested in a certain contract. That means a lot of people are pricing in. They're like, oh, we're going to go up to $50, so we're going to buy the 50C, and there's a lot of volume on that. <laughs> right? So uh, it, it's just a supply and demand. IV is actually usually back calculated, right? So we often say like, oh, you know, why, why is my premium dropping? Oh, it's because IV is dropping, or data is burning it, stuff like that. But it's really just the interest in, of the market. Uh, it's, it's just a function of interest from the market, right? Um, when a lot of people are playing a certain thing or an IV goes up and people are paying higher premiums for it, then IV increases, right? That means a lot of people are expecting that this move to happen. But then you realize that, you know, sometimes those expectations are, are not correct, right? A good example of that would be GME. I mean, in that case, the expectations are actually kind of correct because you know, people are expecting a short squeeze, whatever. They're piling in. People are thinking Wall Street Best is going to keep betting it up, bidding it up. And so that's why your IV is so high on those contracts. But most of the time, when you have high IV, you try to sell at the high IV because the actual action or price action will be less than what the market is trying to say will happen or what people are interested in. So uh, I pulled up Chewy here. If you look on the left side of the chart, you can pull up historical data, right? It's one where you get your information. You can look at options prices, volatility, and Greeks, which is what I'm going to click on right now. All right. So here you can see what the IV is. And these are for expiring 26, which doesn't matter because that was or that's already expired. And unfortunately, I don't think I can go to April 1st. Yep. Because I need, I need a, I may be paying, but okay. Uh, let's just ignore that for now. So here we see that the implied volatility for the day is 26.4%. And um, just let's just say that today's Friday and that these options are still valid. So the implied volatility is probably really, really low. And the reason for that is because it's zero days to expire. That means people aren't expecting a big move left to happen in the last day of trading right like we're just like it's just gonna be flat right um or maybe not necessarily flat but it's not gonna move that much compared to what people were expecting before and you can also see here what the historic volatility is so historically you know we expect should we to have more like a 74 percent iv so uh this is more useful when you are comparing you know across across weeks uh but i don't have that data right now because i'm i don't have a premier membership on bar charts um but you can pull this up on on you know your brokers as well so you see here that the iv is really high on certain things and really low on other things so sometimes you can take advantage of this iv skew okay. um let me try to let me try to go here so so there's a option and underneath options and it's called iv rank and iv percentile And then here you can see um, the implied volatility. So that's IV, right? And then you can see the IV rank. So when you see something like 100% on IV rank, 
that means that IV is very high compared to the past year. So we see here a definition for IV rank. The active money average implied volatility relative to the highest and lowest value over the past year. So if IV rank is at 100%, that means that IV is at the highest level over the past one year period. So here we see IV rank for Baidu is 100%. And I, you know, that makes perfect sense because Baidu, um, you know, we, we, we saw the chart earlier. It went up down $30 and it went up $30. For Baidu, that's a huge intraday move. And that's probably why IV spiked up so much. Because now people are going like, oh, it's going to go down even more. Or it's going to bounce up and it's going to go up $50 or something, right? So that's why you have a lot more interest in certain options contracts. Because the move that happened was so big and people are expecting a continued big move. Either back up or, or back further down, right? Like a complete breakdown. And so that's why you see this high IV. Um, but you see this elevated IV happen as you draw closer to uh, earnings reports and we just take advantage of that with our calendar spreads. Uh, I, I don't remember what other stocks there were, but TME, also another uh, Chinese ticker, right? Tencent also has 100% IV. IQ, same thing. All these tickers were ones that moved very, very strongly on Friday, and that's what happens when um, when you get strong moves like that, IV or interest in those options increases because everybody's always looking for those quick, fast plays, right? Then you have other stocks that are like really, really low IV, and people are like, oh, Microsoft, that doesn't even move. Like, you know, it goes up like $4 and it goes down $4 like in a month. So I'm not interested in playing that. So then you have low IV and the premiums are low. But right now, the premiums are really high on these high volatility stocks. That's why it's called implied volatility, right? Uh, and it's just reflective of the interest in those contracts. Went off on a tangent again. Um, but anyways, uh, going back to the calendar spreads, that's what I'm looking for. You know, you, 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 check, you check the IV skew, see if the IV skew is good. I never take an IV skew that's less than 50%. Ideally, I want more than 100%, though. Uh, if I really wanted to take a play though, at 50 to 70%, I would consider it if it is trading in a good range and I like the range. And I'm like, I'm pretty confident that I can accurately tell, you know, that the price is going to be within a certain range, then I would consider taking a calendar call spread on those as well. But otherwise, if it's like some tickers that I, I'm not really as familiar with, or, you know, they might have wild moves sometimes, then usually I, I try to find something with higher IV skew so I can help cushion uh, those moves, those big moves, if they do happen, right? Um, but yeah, that's that's how I play ca uh, calendar spreads. Um, but yeah, I'd wait until Tuesday and see what Chewy's up to. And and my guess is, you know, I, I'd prefer to do something like 82C uh, because it's right smack in the middle of my expected range, right? But we still have two whole trading days before Tuesday close. Um, so, you know, just wait to see what happens. Then usually you take something close to the uh, closing price of that day. Uh, and then you can add like one or two strikes away depending on your bias, right? If you have a bias. Normally, I, I, I recommend just sticking close to the middle. It's less stressful. Um, and I find that for myself, it's more profitable that way too. Uh, I think I'm just gonna close it here with the ER calendar spreads. Does anybody, if you guys have any other questions or things that you wanna talk about, uh, hit me up in the chat. Um, so spindle blood, you just select the strikes for calendar spreads, you know, for calendar spreads to make max profit, like for example, if this was true 82 C you want it to be exactly at $82. This is where I want the price to be to hit max profit, but I have a range of profit, right? Because it's a neutral strategy, right? But I have a range for my profit, but I make max profit. If I get the strike, correct. I don't try to get the strike correct. I don't want to try to predict what will happen with the ER. That's why I use this to get a range because I can be, I'm more comfortable saying that Chewy is likely to be between $70 to $90 instead of saying after ER, Chewy is going to be exactly $78. That's, that's really hard to do. Like you never know what's going to happen. And, and that's, it's just a game of probabilities with these kinds of spreads and options. Right? So that's why, uh, you know, you, you try to pick something that you think is more likely 
to be hit, right? But you, in the end, you just I just try to pick really close to the strike because that maximizes uh, my chances of success because the expected move is going to be based off of the closing price. So let's say that the expected move is plus or minus 5%. And I'd be like, okay, so the closing price is $82, and what's 5% plus of that or minus of that, right? But if you pick close to the strike, you don't have to worry about it if it drops after hours or arises after hours, because it's more likely to rise and then comes back down, and then, you know, it does whatever, right? Um, so try not to be too directional with your, your strikes. Yep, just pick a strike that's close to where, the, uh, where it's trading at right before close. Uh, and then you can do add some bias if you lean a certain way, but I don't recommend doing too much. That's that's just my personal experience. I found more success when I try to be non-directional. When I try to predict what will happen, I usually end up failing. Uh, so I try not to predict too much with ERs because you never know, right? And and I just stick with a more neutral strike. And then you know I I might make less profit than if I had guessed correctly what strike it was. Say it went up to eighty seven dollars. But you're still green, right? Or but because instead, what if it went down to like seventy four dollars? Then if I picked something like eighty seven, then I, I'd be way deep red, right? So it's it's just better to pick uh, something more neutral. All right, guys. Uh, you know, hope hope you guys you know learned something from this. And I know it was pretty long. Uh, <laughs> hopefully, you didn't get too bored. Um. The websites I'm using, optionstrat.com, also barchat.com. Uh, all right, so it, we're going to close that for today. Um, if you guys got any more questions or you want more chart reviews, uh, definitely vote on the weekend report ticker uh, voting form. Um, that's posted in the options watch list, or just hit me up on the Discord, and I, I can answer some questions there too. Uh, but I, I'm going to head out now and get lunch because it's already one o'clock for me um and i've been streaming for three hours so thanks again for joining us guys see you uh, probably maybe two weeks from now uh might be one next week we'll, we'll see um but yep see you guys around <laughs>